more pyramids with more George Howard. You're listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. Coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science, nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed, high atop the Airways Plateau. Pyramids! Popping bees on pyramids. <laughs> Here at Brothers of the Servant Podcast, <laughs> we're joined in studio for the whole show uh, by Laura, the snake wife. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, she's a... Uh, we How's it going, just, babe? Uh, yeah. It's going good. Glad to have you in here. We uh, we were always getting requests like, where where did Laura go? Uh, after the and I'm you know, so I was like, hey, you're free tonight. Yep. You know, the the, the little demon is being taken care yep. of by the grandparents. We sent uh, him up to the tower. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so I invited her to come on the show, and she said, hell yes. So that's great. Also, I wanted to say, Ty, congratulations, buddy. Our <laughs> Ty, our our friend Ty last yeah. night. Uh, we were we were having a conjunction party, you know, Snake Bros, Al- Allen family style conjunction party. We were all up on the deck at the top, the Allen house, and uh, we had the telescopes out, and we were watching the planets, and we were looking at the moon, and we were all hanging out, and Ty chose that time to propose to his lovely girlfriend, and of course she said yes, and we just wanted to say congratulations to both of you guys. That was really cool to be there for that, and I think it was a great idea. So, it was beautiful. Yeah, very well done. This magic moment. <laughs> I hope the Snake Force can see the video. We got great video <laughs> footage. I hope we can somehow arrange for everyone to get to see that because yeah. it was it was beautiful. Yeah, was Kyle perfect. did Kyle did start playing this magic moment. <laughs> we blasted her with a spotlight. Over the, yeah, we Kyle turns on the spotlight, bam, and she's sitting there and she's like, What is going on? <laughs> And, to, and what was it? Tex, yeah. his dog is the is the ring bearer. Yeah, had the, had the he ring had it, on his collar. He had it tied to his collar. So he's like, Tex, come here, buddy. <laughs> he goes running over. <laughs> gets the ring. Kyle blasts the song. I'm holding the phone, oh, video man. ring, and it's just yeah. it was great. He's like, I've been waiting 800 years for this. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I'm laughing at the lyrics because you know they're like softer than a summer night. And I'm like, yeah, we're it's the winter solstice. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the depths of oh, winter and it's like the summer night. Yeah. All right. Uh, it was great. It was cliche and fantastic. So. Yeah. Congratulations to both of you guys. Yeah, we're and, so uh, happy. Yeah. For anybody who doesn't know, Ty is, you know, he's practically a brother to us. He's been good friends with Kyle for a long time. He's also the lead guitarist of $50 Dynasty. And he was the first caller on the he show. He was the very first caller and one of the first listeners we ever had. So, uh, yeah. So, we really... Uh, congratulations again to both of you guys. And uh, it was really, really special. And we've been... Well, I have been very picky about any woman who may or may not have been eligible for this position. And I <laughs> love Lisa! Lisa is great. I love her so much. Yeah. I'm so happy that we get to keep her forever. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> We yep. get to keep her forever. We get to I'm keep so her happy. forever. <laughs> wow. I was really hoping we could keep her forever. Now we can, and so I'm happy. <laughs> All right. Let's go ahead and do uh, Space Brother News. And of course, we have Conjunction. We'll talk about that. And also, this solar wind has arrived. A few days earlier than expected, a stream of high-speed solar wind hit Earth's magnetic field on December 22nd. This gaseous material is flowing from a northern hole in the sun's atmosphere, and minor G1-class geomagnetic storms are possible during the next 24 hours as Earth moves deeper into this stream. And the great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. The last time this happened, the telescope hadn't been invented yet. Last night, however, optics around the world were trained on Jupiter and Saturn as the two planets converged for an 800-year great conjunction. Uh, on December 21st, 2020, Jupiter and Saturn passed in the night only 0.1 degrees apart. These two planets came equally close in 1623, but that conjunction was impossible to see from Earth because of the glare from the sun. So the last time these two worlds were so close together and easy to see was in the year 1226. Uh, 
and more images are pouring in from around the world. So you can browse the photo gallery at spaceweather.com to look at a lot of these, uh, <clears throat> some of the, some of these pictures they have that people took are absolutely beautiful. So I recommend going to spaceweather.com to check that out. And, uh, yeah, we were able, Kyle and I were able to see it the night before on the 20th. We yep. tried to, we got up there on the deck and we set up the telescope cause I have, a uh, a motorized one that's you know basically where you can once you've got it aligned to the sky you can say okay go to this object and it'll just spin around and then track it which is great so we were like let's get it aligned so that tomorrow you know we can just use it so we aligned it and we were watching the conjunction on the 20th uh which is not when they were completely as close as they were going to get but we could still see them together in uh in one view in the telescope which was pretty awesome yeah uh, and we had clear skies that night. The next night, on the actual conjunction, the 21st, it was cloudy. Well, partly cloudy. So the planets peeked out of the clouds a couple of times. And but we were, everybody at the party got to see it, I that's think. That's right. right. Yeah? Yeah. Everyone, everyone that came to, yeah, everybody got a view yeah. for a few minutes when they were, you know, there was a period where they were going, kind of going in and out of the clouds, and they get hazy, and then they get clear, and they get hazy. But everybody got to see it. And we had like an alarm button whenever they pop out of the clouds. Oh yeah, come over, <laughs> yeah, come take over. a look, take a look. <laughs> yeah, and I, of course, Kyle and I had planned to like leave the telescope out because it once this telescope has a feature where once you've got it aligned, uh, you can do this thing where you tell it to go to sleep, and you can turn it off, uh, but it stays aligned if you don't move yeah. it. And so I was trying to do that, but I hit park instead of sleep. And park just means it spins itself back around to zero and then turns off. <laughs> so we turned it on the next day, expecting it to be already aligned. And it's like, do you want to align the telescope? And I was like, no. <laughs> so, I mean, yes. Rookie but move. No. <laughs> rookie move. Yeah. I hit park instead of sleep. But yeah, it was a, it was a great, it was a. But it all worked out. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody got to see it and it was cool. Yeah. Uh, all right. So current conditions. Solar wind speed is a high, 537.8 kilometers per second. Oh, wow. And the density is also high, 11.8 protons per cubic centimeter. Oh, wow. Uh, sunspot number right now is 11. Uh, and the 2020 total spotless dates is down to 58%. Uh, let's see. The uh, neutron count right now is 8.8% above the space age average, which is rated as high. And the KP index currently is at two, which is quiet. And the 24-hour max is only three, which is also rated as quiet. Hmm. So there you go. You're in your spaceweather.com. Last time it was Stuff. one. So right. It is yeah, it's a little up. higher. Yeah. Yeah. We're getting hit by that uh, solar wind stream. I, I wonder if that's what's causing it to go up. Cool, cool. Well, I've got some news stories, or if you want to do emails or whatever, what do you... What's yeah, the, we've got emails. Gifts happen. Oh, that's Snake Bros Christmas too. That's right. We have a stack. <laughs> we have a stack of one-up boxes. This is the best job for me. I just want you to know. When yeah, packages she's... come in the mail and I get to open them, and stuff, and <laughs> like... it's like the absolute best job. For she me. sends us messages like, "Oh my God, guys, you're gonna <laughs> not believe what you got." All right. <laughs> she doesn't tell us what it is. Just tells us that she knows what it is. <laughs> and then I'm really excited. Yeah, she's like, "I can't wait for you to open yeah. them." <laughs> Thank you for letting me do this. <laughs> but you're also kind of, you know, the taste tester. It's like, you know, yeah. if it explodes, then it's just yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, because now we have the new carpet and we just finished remodeling our room, there was this thought that went through my head today. Like, what if not everybody's gotten that message? So I actually took the boxes out of my room into the kitchen. <laughs> just in case, just in just in case. case. something exploded. <laughs> Giant snakes flew out of the box. <laughs> so do you want to do this now? Or? Yeah, let's go ahead and okay, do the boxes. So here's one. All right. This is... There's a note in there. There's a note. That's not the note. Okay, I was like, is this is a this is a Chinese one dollar bill. <laughs> Here's the note. It says, "Howdy y'all." As I said in my Gmail, I love the podcast. I will say it is dangerous. Nearly dropped a weight on myself at the gym because of spontaneous hilarity. <laughs> These rocks are from a stream bed at around. Uh, three, uh, 3,200 meters on the Tibetan Plateau. Figured you would appreciate them more than most. It still blows my mind to find these on a mountain. Also, here is one RMB for your pyramid scheme. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Keep kicking ass and spreading knowledge from John. 
So these are rocks from the Tibetan. Oh, wow. Man. Yeah, those are beautiful. Ooh. Oh. It's a fossil. Yes. Marine fossils. Oh, Come yeah. On. That's like a, it looks like an ammonite. Yeah, it, it does. And here's another piece of it. Wow, that's that's awesome, That's amazing. Dude. Thank you so Man, much. Thank you. These are beautiful. Yeah, that is definitely. Yep. Marine fossils from up on the mountain in the Tibetan plateau. That's awesome. Thank you so much, man. Wow. Those are going in the collection. Yes, they will. Yep. Little uh, crystallized forms inside there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can see the, um, from on one of these broken ones, you can see the. Um, this is for the cat? The little yeah. chambers inside the, the, cat. the ammonite. That's awesome. <laughs> this is emailed to Russ's cat in the tower that are mailed. That's the, that's <laughs> because warm and fuzzies also like to have warm and fuzzies. <laughs> and because Laura has so much fun opening them from Anne. Ah. <laughs> she knows. She knows. Oh, she knows. <laughs> All and right. Like this is a special warm and fuzzy yes. for the fawns. Look at this. For the fawns. <laughs> and look, there's God, even so danglies beautiful. on the corner. Oh, no. He's going to destroy I know, the danglies. That's what I thought. I saw it. I was like, oh, this is gorgeous. And then I thought, oh, man, I hope he doesn't destroy Oh, it. man, this is great. He's going to absolutely <laughs> love this. See, he's already decided that the other one she sent me is his. So I'm going to have to explain to him very carefully that this is his and the other one is mine. I think those danglies are made to be destroyed by the <laughs> Okay, so that's what I was kind of thinking, too. Maybe she just was like, you know what? We're going to go all in on yeah. this. Yeah, so this is another, it's another beautiful, uh, like a square blanket. We should have a before and after pic. What it looks like before you give it to him. <laughs> what it looks like after six months. <laughs> well, it will soon go through destructive testing, I can tell you that. Thank you so I, much, so Anne. Everybody has to know that Anne's skills oh my with God. the yarn yeah. are it's just mind-blowing. Even yeah. I mean, when she just, doesn't math, it still looks yeah. really good. Yeah. <laughs> she had to tell me what the what the math problem was on the other one. She finally told me what it was. Okay, so I I was halfway in on that because she was like, I'll give you another hint later, but then I never got to. So you now know. Yeah. She, so so okay. on the, the previous one she sent me, it's got kind of a... Um, it's got a, it's got four quadrants. So if you sort of look at it from one perspective, there are points going north, south, east, and west, or okay. you know, up, down, left, and right. And she said, count the little balls of yarn thing up next to those points. And I counted them, and then four of them ha or three of them have nine, and one only has eight. <laughs> okay. And I told her that was unacceptable, and I wanted a refund. <laughs> <laughs> Because when she showed, because you know we were up there trying to figure it out. Yeah, because Laura and I were like, I was like, we're I don't even know. For like twenty minutes, and I'm like how? counting things, and I'm like, it's got, it's all math, it's got to be. <laughs> yeah. But when she sent me the picture to show me, it's in this area. It wasn't the corners that I was thinking weren't even on there. So I was like, okay, I was yeah. wrong. Okay, here's another one. All right. Yeah. This one's kind of heavy. Kind of heavy. And there should be a good. Yeah, there's a note. Yeah, there. Oh wow, this is a book. Oh. Ooh. And I left that for you to open right there. This? That because look at the bottom. It's a pyramid. Yeah, but look at the bottom. Okay. I was gonna what let you open What does the bottom say? Part. Open me. Yeah, but read the note. Open sesame. Yeah. yeah. This is a very long note. But it's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it says hello, Snake Bros. I hope you're doing well. Am I mistaken, or did Laura say she has one in the oven in your last podcast? If so, congratulations, Kyle. I have been meaning to send this for some time, and I finally found the time to do it. You guys are awesome and deserve much thanks and support. You have your boy Brad to thank me for finding your show. Back in the spring, he told all Cosmographia listeners to check out the interview you did with the doctor who talked about space viruses. And I have been hooked ever since. <laughs> Before cool. that, I had no idea who the two weirdos were on <laughs> Randall's podcast. <laughs> I have listened to all of your episodes, minus episode one, of course, at least once. And I'm now going through all of them for a second time to catch anything I might have missed and for the sheer entertainment. At first, like a lot of people, I had trouble telling which one of you was talking until I realized that uh, one of you sounds almost exactly like Jack Black. And that, of course, is Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I knew you were going to love that <laughs> My brother and I manage an orchard, just like you guys, oh. although we are joined by a sister as well. 
You are the same age ages as my brother and I, too. I'm the older one. I think this is part of why I have connected with your podcast. You're so relatable and down to earth. You have also spoken frequently about your upbringing and being homeschooled. My wife and I have decided to homeschool our two kids this year, partly because of COVID. If anybody ever tells me they have doubts about homeschooling, I can just direct them to your podcast for proof that it works <laughs> and also proof that it may not work sometimes. Yes. <laughs> a certificate of ignorance beats a college degree any day as far as I'm concerned. I do hope that you will stop saying the Permian extinction was followed by the Cambrian explosion, though. I can't help but think my public education let me down. The, I did six years in the Navy, so I have been to many of the con uh, countries you talk about, but I knew nothing of the fascinating history of those places. I was in Crete, but I didn't go to the Minoan sites. I was in Turkey several times and never once went to an underground city. <laughs> Most regrettably, I was on Malta and never went anywhere near a hypogeum. <laughs> My, history, my high school history class went something like this. The Sumerians invented writing, end of lesson. The Egyptians built pyramids and put mummies in them, end of lesson. Now let's talk about the Greeks and Romans for the rest of the semester. Uh, yes. <laughs> if only I knew. This is not an attack on the teachers. They are like the Egyptian stone workers being told to carve a 50-foot 50 tall, 50 tall obelisk out of granite with nothing more than a copper chisel and a diorite ball, and it has to be done in 36 weeks. <laughs> So in closing, I do hope you enjoy this package. I've been meaning to repay you guys for the fine show you produce. I recently did some Christmas shopping in your merch store and gave some bucks to your pyramid scheme. My, hey, sister, my sister makes the jam and jelly and my kids and I make apple butter. The pyramid is made of apple wood, in case you were wondering. The grain kind of looks like stone, so I thought it was fitting. And I plan to donate to the pyramid scheme regularly to get you to them giant triangles soon. <laughs> <laughs> for future guests ideas, you really need to get David Politis and Tony Zamora in for a talk. Watching Zamora's YouTube channel is what got me started down the ancient mysteries rabbit hole, and the missing 411 stuff is so captivating and scary. So keep up the good work of spreading the non-fake news. From Paul. <laughs> and P.S., since you grew up in the 90s like me, I have always wondered if the band Nirvana had any influence on you. Oh, yeah. I love every one of their songs, and now the phrase, Alexa, play Nirvana, is commonly uttered in my house. <laughs> great letter. Oh, uh, that's great. <laughs> wow, that that's really cool, dude. Butter. You guys, look at all this. Man. And yeah, Nirvana, Nirvana had a big influence on me. Mainly, uh, I don't. There's something about that guy's simple yeah. guitar riffs, yeah. but the way he combined chords together that just captivated me uh, early on when I was getting more into the, you know, rock and roll side of guitar. And uh, yeah, I learned a bunch of them, and uh, it's a great style. Love it. And I love so, the yeah. similarity is of them working on the orchard and the brother and the sister. And <laughs> so he sent cinnamon cider jelly, pear jam, uh, strawberry rhubarb jam, and homemade apple butter. Mm. Man. I can't wait. And now we should Get too bad hungry. I'm on a diet and I can't eat any of it. Well, I'll eat it for you and tell <laughs> yeah, you how it is. Laura can eat all of it and she'll tell me. Because <laughs> I'm a pregnant lady. And yes, you were right. There is a bun in this oven. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the wooden three-sided pyramid that says open me on the bottom. Let's see. If I can get and that is beautiful wood. Yeah. That apple wood. I'm going to get this. Uh... Since duct tape was involved, I thought I'd just let you do it. <laughs> Did you look in here? No. Oh. What is it? <laughs> is it a spaceman? I think it's a oh, spaceman. Oh, it's a mummy. Oh, it's a mummy. <laughs> it's right. It's a toilet paper mummy. I, I vote spaceman. <laughs> it's, oh, it's a guy wrapped in toilet, wrapped paper. toilet paper. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> also uh, from space, though. Also from space. Oh, that's Definitely good. Definitely a mummy, a uh, spaceman mummy wrapped in toilet paper okay, inside gonna, the three sided pyramid <laughs> made I'm of apple. I'm taking a photo apple of that little spaceman mummy. That's and great. It on the Discord. Ah. Okay, we have one more. Okay. And this thing is like. This thing. So cool. Hi. <laughs> Let Kyle open this one. The, yes, Kyle, you should open uh, this okay. one. All right. Uh, man, I just want to thank all of you so yes, much. For this yes, yes. So thank you. So this, awesome. this has been a great Christmas spiel right now, and I have something I want to say after this one's oh. completed. United States flag. Made in the USA. Annan. Wow. And there's a note. 
Snake Bros, I want to thank you for what you've been doing. You might not realize it, but your voices were echoing over the skies of some pretty sporty areas over the past few months. Now, they were echoing inside earbuds, but nonetheless, they were there. <laughs> yes, Kyle and Russ's spectacular, straightforward, sentient sounds spoke sulfuriously, <laughs> sufficiently, succinctly, specializing scientifically. I ran out of S words. <laughs> seriously. Oh, you got seriously in there. Seriously, though. <laughs> You've kept many of us entertained and informed while we were away from our families and our amazing country. You were able to bring a little piece of that to where I was located, and it means a lot. Loved hearing about your adventures over the Southwest. Keep doing what you're doing. If you're ever up in Missouri, let me know. Uh, there are petroglyphs in Squaw Creek National Wildlife Refuge that I think you'd like to see. All right. I hope you have a very Merry Christmas and an even better New Year. Keep your powder dry. Signed. Redacted. All right. Holy crap. They, so read they that. flew this yes. over read this. Read what this is. Okay, it's got a certificate here. The United States Air Force. This is to certify that the accompanying American flag was flown on the fourth day of November 2020 in your honor aboard a U.S. Air Force C-130H aircraft during combat missions into... Redacted. What? <laughs> Dude! Oh like, oh isn't God. this the coolest thing? <laughs> On behalf of Captain... Redacted and redacted as well. The men and women of the... S redacted. Redacted. Data expunged. Expeditionary Airlift Squadron and the crew of... Also redacted. While deployed to... Redacted. Yet again. Airbase... Supporting America's war on terrorism during Operation Final Redaction. Hell wow. yeah, dude. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. I know. I, Thank you is, so much. Oh, oh my yes, God. Yes. I don't know what to flag. say. Yeah. I had to have this moment all by myself in the kitchen today. <laughs> I was just like, ah! Oh my I gotta call somebody, but I can't. <laughs> so. Oh. What? I just realized the name was redacted. Well, you didn't say the whole name. What name? <laughs> it's redacted. Of course, it's always redacted, and yeah. it will always be redacted. But you didn't say the whole thing, so. Name is redacted. <laughs> so I would. this is what I would like to say. Here in our subdivision, you know, we've got the flag that is up at the front gate. And whenever it gets tattered, Nancy carefully goes up there and gets it, and she repairs it, and... We always have a nice looking flag up there. And I've always thought, that's really nice of her. That's really cool. And I've always thought, man, we should fly a flag like that. I'm like, eh, what am I going to do? Let's just like go by. I don't know. <laughs> now, look. No, we are not flying. No, no, no. no this no. flag no, goes no. into a frame. Yeah. Really? I had a whole different plan. Uh -uh, you no. fly this flag. Yeah. Okay. No. So this because it's already been flown? What? Why? Because you don't, you, you preserve the flag. Okay. Well, it's, what I was going to say is, if we were going to fly that at our house, I was going to take such great care of it. Every, <laughs> no, no, you can't Every it time it got tattered, I was going to go and take it down and get my sewing machine out and mend it just like Nancy does ours. <laughs> I had these big plans for how I was going to baby this thing. But apparently, it's going to be baby. It's going to be baby in a in frame, a in a frame okay. with this with this on a plaque. Yeah, so we're gonna have to get it folded in the proper triangle yes. thing. It's gonna be yeah. This is amazing. Wow. You're not touching this flag. <laughs> okay. All right, we're gonna have to look it up how to get it folded in the proper triangle. And uh, well, thanks. we got I Joe just, down the street again. Okay, I want to we'll say go down to Joe and Nancy. This and is them. amazing. Thank you guys so much. This the means flag, a lot. the certificate, the letter. Wow. Unbelievable. This really means a lot to us. And I wish Russ would have read it because he would have read it better than me. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, that was awesome. But uh, Merry Christmas, all you snakes. Thank you for Merry all these Christmas. gifts. Thank you so much. Thank you for totally sending them honored to me. Snake bros so that I can open them. <laughs> I don't even know how to express uh, the feeling of gratitude. It's just yeah. overflowing. Very special. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to take a picture wow. of this little mummy and put it on Discord so everybody can see. <laughs> yeah, this wrap the toilet paper. <laughs> and thank oh, you, Anne, for your stuff. Everybody. All right, well, time we got take here. an early break. And, yeah, uh, all right, well, we're getting George Howard on. We've already done that. We're doing the old time loophole <laughs> thing right. here. And uh, had a great interview with him. 
for an hour, and uh, we'll see you on the other side of that. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, Brothers of the Serpent podcast, and very happy to welcome back friend of the show, George Howard of the CosmicTusk.com. He just got back from a fantastic Egypt trip, which we were following through uh, social media. George, welcome back. Snakes! 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 <laughs> Tusk! I said it many times over there. I hadn't found one of the videos yet, but I know I've got at least two or three that where I just bark out snakes. <laughs> All right, spreading the love into Egypt. In some sacred, sacred ancient temple, you know. And, uh, <laughs> yes. Now y'all, y'all were there. You, you were there. You had a lot of fans there, fellows. You really did. Uh, All right. The bus were regular listeners. Wow, oh, wow. that's wow. cool. Oh, yeah. warm and fuzzies. Oh man. Yeah. That's great. Well, no, George, I, I have to say, you're probably at, at this point, I think that you are our most recurring guest, right? This would be his third time coming on the show. Yeah, I guess so, buddy. Yeah. Hey, that's quite an honor, guys, particularly as you develop the show so much further than we were talking in the early days. Man. Yeah. I'm just loving it lately. Um, no, it's just the production gets better and better, and the content's always been superb. So you're doing a good job. All right. Thank you. So, so what we. The reason we're here to talk to you, bro, is because of our favorite topic, pyramids. Pyramids, tell you us about the pyramids. You went to Egypt, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so you went to Egypt, and, and you're basically fresh, yeah. freshly back, right? You've been back for less than a week or a week-ish or something? What is it today? No, it's been about eight days. Okay. Then I came home and isolated for a few days, so I've only been with friends and family for less than a week. Yeah, so but we want to get uh, the perspective fresh from your mind i you you sure. know you yeah i know you're not an expert but as a as a as a person who is interested in these topics and then you went there with probably one of the best tour groups you could get you went with ben from uncharted x and jimmy uh from bright insight and you know you guys had yusuf so tell us about your experience and and what happened to you did it change your mind on things like let, let's let's just hear the story well i <clears throat> y'all do get it fresh because you know it has to marinate a little bit for a few days and this is the first time i've spoken to anybody i guess electronically on it so it is my fresh thoughts for better or worse um but remember i come from it from the catastrophe part you know i'm the younger driest guy or a part of that and that's normally what i'm trying to communicate you kind of got to pick your fights in speculative science and while i probably consume you know nearly as much ancient Egypt and alternative history guys as you and your fans do, my public relations such that they are, are generally concerning the catastrophe. So I went over there with that viewpoint uh, to learn, you know, not, not to come home and teach or tell y'all, you know, about the various Egyptian dynastic complications of which there are many. Um, I went over there to see whether I could, you know, add some things to my story. And I was well impressed, gentlemen. It, it was uh, it exceeded all expectations, and a lot of that was not just for the content, but but, but rather the context of the tour. The content was av obviously going to be fa fabulous, but it, but it was wonderful to go over there in a in a such an awkward context, um, in that the country was empty. Yeah, we didn't have anyone else there. There were no other tourists. Period. And mm -hmm. we would pull our bus into uh, a parking lot that would normally, you know, be hosting 50 or 100 or 200 buses from people all over the world, particularly Asia and Japan and China. Uh, thank goodness have a, you know, high regard for Egypt and, and travel there and, and think the country is fascinating. I think it's a worldwide, you know, shared fascination. But they weren't there. No Europeans were there. And no Americans were there. Hmm. So we traveled from location to location as we confirmed, or I personally confirmed with a, an army general there, 
that we were the only tour bus in Egypt there. Wow. So you had a confluence of things, and it, that's just one of them. Perhaps just as important, and this applies to everyone that goes to Egypt in the future, in 2019, the current director of the um, Supreme uh, Council of Antiquities um, loosened a lot of restrictions, not all at once, but here and there, and strategically, they, they made uh, visiting to Egypt you know, a little bit more open as far as what you can see and what you can do. A great example is that in, in all of its history, no one's been allowed to take photos in the Cairo Museum. Yeah. Right? There have been a lot of sneak photos, <laughs> and a lot of people have taken photos there surreptitiously. Um, but but nobody had been allowed to, you know, legally and according to rule. And he opened up on that on 2019. But like more relevant to our trip, he opened up the Bent Pyramid yeah. of Deshur. And, and that was in late 2019. And then, of course, it didn't even have time to get cooking out there with tourists before COVID shut it down. So then we pop up there as perhaps some of the very first people since 1950 and certainly the first with all the equipment we had. There's just no doubt that we covered some of these sites more thoroughly with a greater variety of fairly sensitive modern media equipment than anyone ever has. Man, that's awesome. Ah, so what so kind jealous. of uh, what kind of equipment did you guys take? I know that you did you get some kind of lidar attachment for your phone? How did that work? Well, it's kind of funny thing, you know, it's good you ask because it is it's interesting that I noticed uh, two months ago that when they announced the new iPhone that it came with LiDAR. And we use LiDAR a lot in my work, and I have a lot of respect for LiDAR and, you know, fine-tune elevation, or in this case, just spatial data. And so I went and bought a new iPhone just for the trip. But a couple of other folks, uh, Scott and Lizzie from Philly came, and they did the exact same thing and were more determined than I was. So <laughs> I quickly realized that we only needed one LiDAR couple. And they went... <laughs> and scanned every single bit of everything we saw. And I got like a half dozen, you know, did the King's Chamber and some other places like that. But um, so we had that, we had the new LiDAR tools. But more than that, there there were a lot of people that got a lot of great video and even had video where you could insert it into the drill holes. We're going to expect to see some of that back. Uh -huh. We've actually got macro lens stuff from inside the circular drill holes. Uh, people brought laser equipment. Now, none of this was exotic, and I think contrary to what the Egyptians would 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 allow, um, but they allowed a lot while we were there, and a lot more than most people probably uh, have enjoyed in the past. Yeah. Yeah. So I know you went to the Serapium. What was your impression in there? Oh, that's a great, great question. Um, the Serapium was was just as incredible as Ben had made it out in his videos. And just like any of your other uh, uh, regular listeners, you know, those that follow him, I'd seen some of um, Ben's work on Uncharted X on the Serapium, and yeah. I was unaware of it. And it lived up to expectations. I found it one of the most enigmatic things I'd ever seen in my life. Um, and incidentally, I should say, I kind of grew up with Egypt. Strangely enough, I kind of come by it honestly. My father did a whole lot of work there as a construction executive, just like your father did, mm. an international construction executive. And we had a family company that, that built the water treatment plant for Cairo and the water treatment plant for Abu Dhabi and the water treatment plant for, for you know, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. So my family was constantly, or people in our community were constantly traveling back and forth from Greensboro, North Carolina to Egypt. And, um, and it was great to go find my mother did archaeological digs in the Middle East. You know, she was more on that side. So so came by it honestly. But um, I forget where I got off into my family connection. But uh, a little bit of my, my preface to this is it was just, you know, it was a wonderful personal experience to be able to return there. I'd been there twice as a kid. I'd been when I was 12 years old and when I was 18 years old. So it was almost 35 years ago. But yeah. when you go down into the Serapia, first of all, it's not under Saqqara. I had pictured it one way or another, perhaps I wasn't paying attention, that the, the Serapium and the black diorite granite boxes, which characterize it, I thought were intimately connected with the bent pyramid of Saqqara. No. But no, they were off to the side, out in a featureless part of the desert, Yep, not too far of a walk but did not seem intimately connected with it. So the, the bent pyramid had its own game beneath it. It had a very clear, 
either ceremonial or machine purpose, whatever we want to say. But, but there was a certain number of features that were obviously connected with its construction. But then the serapium's off to the side. And yeah. if no one had found it, it would still, and I imagine, I truly do imagine that there are many, many places like that in Egypt that they just haven't uncovered yet that was off to the side. And then it had a modern entrance, you know, with modern laid stone. And then you went down in the serapium, and strangely enough, it was crude cut. Stone. We went into some places like the Valley of the Kings, where you would go into bedrock cut entrances and bedrock tunnels, but they were very finely cut. You went in the Serapium, it was relatively crudely cut. But then within the 24 niches off to the side of the main gallery of the relatively crudely cut tunnel that you're walking through were perfectly perfectly precisely manufactured diorite granite boxes that weighed between seven, 70 and a hundred tons each. <laughs> so your mind tries to process it and says, well, why in the world would somebody that this was my own thing and everybody takes these things differently. But one of the first things that struck me is, and I have no answer like so many of these questions. Yeah. But why would you have a fairly crude cut entrance no art, nothing else of any particular distinguishment. But then within the 24 niches have these boxes that can't be re reproduced by the technologies we have today without effort that no one's managed to make until today. I'm sure if we put ourselves to it, we can come up with such a box. But it, it, it's not something with even in our best tools that you could knock out without a tremendous amount of planning and effort. Right. You, um, you practically have to build special tools to do it, that the tools don't yet exist, but we probably could do it if we set our minds to it. But yeah, it hasn't been done. That's right. And I like to think of a lot of things as allocation of labor and in an economic sense and how in the world they could have diverted the intensity that you would have to have as a civilization that was supposed to, have, you know, to some degree have lived on the edge, been one step ahead of hunter gatherers how you could have devoted the attention. A lot of people say the same thing about Gebekli Tepe, and I'm not quite as amazed. You know, you'll, you'll say, well, maybe those hunter and gatherers just make them some crudely cut, you know, three meter high uh, T-shaped pillars, right? But the, the, the complication in making one of those hundred ton diorite black boxes that have perfect precision to them uh, versus making something at Gebekli Tepe, um, is much greater and also the precision of it and just the feel of it was much greater than both the tunnels you were in and even the Saqqara pyramid itself. So it, it, you know, lended, lent some support to me that there was something else going on, that there was a precursor technology, if you will. Yeah. Perhaps not something that would floor us, but something that just hasn't, well, it certainly would floor us, but probably something that hadn't been considered before. There, there was something else going on, gentlemen. Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, of course, I've never been in one of these, but you can imagine like these bunkers or places that they would put um, radioactive waste yeah. or something like that, where the bunker is just concrete. It's very crude, but then you get to the materials that are encased in these in incredibly uh, finely built things or whatever that whatever yeah. they're holding them in. that's yeah, an excellent point yeah. that's an excellent point and i really had to consider that way it's like cheyenne mountain out there in in outside of denver yeah. right where they 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 put the interballistic missile protection yes that those are i never thought of that that those are crudely cut tunnels when you see them going in you can actually see then smooth it all out in, in places I, I don't even i don't think you know they're, they're the u.s uses a lot of places like that the uh uh salt caves that you know, yeah. these things can be stored in and whatnot, that they'll be crude on the outside, but then you'll have sophisticated technology entombed within them. Right. Precision. I'm preci using the term too. Yeah. yeah. Pre precision containers inside of a crude, crudely cut out, uh, you know, That's interior right. space. Yeah. Did you just say tomb? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Butt flats and tombs. That's all there was over there. And, you know, bronze chisels and, and pounding rocks. Um no, no, no. A, a, a lot of the things that you kick around in jest, uh, you know, with certainly some serious, seriousness behind it, 
you know, was validated over there. That, that it's just hard to picture, as you call them, and it's just the perfect way to, to satirize it, the butt flat people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, <laughs> you know, we don't give them enough respect. Yeah, exactly. And I'll, I'll take some other questions. I'll give you some other spe- other speculation. Yeah, I was. well, I also wanted yeah. to ask about uh, the Osirian. You guys went yeah. there as well, yeah. Yeah, it was fabulous. And and it it it, it typified uh, a, a lot of what I'm getting to is that there would be a subterranean component to obviously dynastic Egyptian constructions. Yeah. Some question there, and maybe some of their cores were different. Maybe that site was sacred for people that preceded them, but there were a number of locations where you had a dynastic Egyptian structure that was accompanied by, like the Assyrian, um, with a different feel of architecture. And yes. the feel of architecture was defined by its order of magnitude, larger precision, and uh, almost grandiosity, but in a sublime way. In other words, the Assyrian, uh, if it did precede the dynastic Egyptians, and it was something, let's say, you know, pre-Diluvian in our ways of thinking, they might have come back and redecorated it, and they did a hell of a good job building the Temple of Osiris above it. You can't take anything from them. They're things that are certainly unexplained about the dynastic Egyptians and how in the hell did they pull off the temple above it. Yeah. But then you go look at what was buried behind and beneath it, just like at Saqqara, and it's on another level, literally right. hmm. another elevation level. Yeah. And and literally on another level of technology and difficulty to build as far as just move, moving the dirt. But then again, they confuse things, and the Syrian but, and the Serapium exhibit this, that they get dated according to who writes on them later. And y'all discuss that so well on your show that I know you understand it, but for people that hadn't followed that to date, that a lot of things in Egypt are dated and attributed by virtue of writing, or perhaps we can call it graffiti in our way of view, that there'll be minor attribution that now has embedded itself as the dating of the location. So when you go in the Serapium, and I'm glad you brought it up, out of those 24 boxes, the site, the the mystery there, it is all attributed to uh, one pharaoh, and it's dated according to hieroglyphs on one of the 24 boxes. Mm. And I've got that all in the, the videos I'll share and, and, and y'all will share on the, the uh, podcast page. But one of the boxes has incredibly crude hieroglyphs uh, knocked into it. I was telling uh, some friends earlier today that, you know, it's better than I could do <laughs> if you gave me a chisel to beat on it, <laughs> but not a whole hell of a lot. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> where, where, where it gave you the impression some courtesan of a pharaoh at a later date gave a shot at attributing the bot, got like broke in there, somehow got in a previously sacred place, got in there, knocked some tributes out to the king, probably got his head cut off, <laughs> right? Because the pharaoh looked at it and said, this this, this box is beautiful. I can't match it. Now you've defaced it. Chop his head off. But then it, <laughs> but, but, but then it lasts, and we attribute its age to that crude carving. And Ben, ben from Uncharted X has done a lot of good work with that, and a lot of the content that comes out from this trip will, will repeat those same themes that we saw where, you know, it's just like Khafre's pyramid. The number one pyramid is attributed based on a piece of graffiti. Now, I'm not saying that it all predates, you know, yeah. Uh, excuse me, Khufu. I said Khufu. Khafre is number two. Khafre is number but two. it's all yeah. attributed. Yeah, it's attributed to so little, and you could almost consider it graffiti. And yes. a lot of in these places all seem reused and recycled. There was dynastic Egyptian art in Assyrian, but the question is, did the builders of the Assyrian put that art there? Yeah. What, what did Yusuf tell you guys about the Assyrian? What was his opinion on that? Was he there with you for that part of the tour? Yeah, his opinion was that it was a recycled site. Okay. And that they built the, the Temple of Seti above it with great respect to the Assyrians. Yeah. They built it architecturally 
with with obviously respect to it, but you wouldn't have built them both at the same time. Right. You just wouldn't. Have. Now, maybe it's domestic Egyptians, both of them, and the, yeah, there's so much time to deal with. You could separate it by hundreds of years and still call them in the same uh, the same line of kings. But <laughs> there's not a known time, I don't think, where you can go where today they'll accept that all of this of this level and this magnitude and 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 this kind of megalithic structure that underlays so much of the 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 uh, uh, above ground temples there. Um, would would have been done by a precursor, you know, within the same line of civilization. Yeah, yeah, and so I know that the Assyrian often is parts of it are submerged. So, what was the water level like when you guys were there? Were you able to get to the lower parts, or was it? No, we we, we were able, and I'm not sure what it generally is. We got lower than Ben did, um, for instance, in Uncharted X, was I know he was interested, and we were able to go and walk along a level that you could see the pools nothing was flooded at the level we were walking at yeah but the pools that we were looking at that were very deliberate pools went down another 10 meters they said yep wow so you had a, a there the, and no one's ever completely drained that stuff yeah they've taken peaks at it and brought it down further than we are and a lot of times it's up above like you're suggesting where we were i believe and yeah. has been historically so you're better off now to see as much of it as you ever have but there's a hell of a lot more to be seen. Um, and that goes on and on. I mean, I could give you, you know, literally several examples if I could take them off my tongue, but the the, the Pyramid of Modun, you know, they all had more dramatic things beneath them than even were above them. But that which was above, you, you, you don't feel like you want a disc. We're not trying to say the dynastic Egyptians were not capable of absolutely incredible works of art and, and and stone carving but you got a feeling that there was another generation before that yeah and, and so uh, the other thing i was interested in and i saw some of this in your photos and by the way i want to tell people george posted a uh, a link to a collection of of his pictures i think there's like over 500 of them in there right george yeah, that's right. And yeah. uh, I'm going to put the links to that in the show notes. Uh, he's also shared it in the Discord, but I'm going to put it in the show notes for this show because I, I went through them and they're just – George has a great eye for great photographs, and also there's just all kinds of fantastic, interesting stuff. And plus, you've got the classic – you know, you're leaning your elbow on the top of the pyramid. Those are hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got some good fun photos. <laughs> yeah, the, I wish I could claim all that myself, but it's the, 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 the young vendor – kids around there the younger ones oh yeah just like they would be here 13 and 14 year olds are basically saying give me a dollar and let me set you up to take a picture where it looks like you're jumping from the pyramid it looks like you're holding the pyramid yeah it looks like i'm <laughs> a rock you know it, it was actually well worth it That's yeah cool. well, they're great young man some more money my yeah, favorite my <laughs> favorite one is where your arms leaning out it looks like you're just leaning on the pyramid that, that one was freaking hilarious so yeah but there's That's lots right of and i yeah. Uh, there, there's, yeah, there's lots of great pictures, over 500, and I'm going to put the links in there. And I just wanted to I wanted to ask you about – now, this is more in general, but I know there was some from the Assyrian, yeah. and there's also some from the uh, the smallest of the big pyramids on Giza. What is it? I can never remember. Men Menkare. 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 The granite yeah. work – you know, so Menkare has the casing stones around the bottom of it, those granite casing stones. Yeah. And the, around the entrance, there's this flattened, smoothed out aspect to those granite casing stones. Whereas when you get farther away from the entrance and farther above it, they haven't been flattened out. And it looks yeah. like that work was done, you know, like somebody had this giant machine that just went in and was just, just flattening these stones out and making them smooth. And there's the same thing in the Assyrian, I noticed in some of the photographs, where it looks like they were scooping out huge chunks of rock to smooth it out and the work was never finished. Did you get more... Uh, did, did you, was this impression given to you over the, over your time in Egypt that the, in a lot of cases, it looked like work was stopped mid work basically? Well, I've got to claim a little ignorance. Most of my knowledge on that aspect of the Menkare period comes from listening to brothers of the serpent and I didn't make it over there. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm both curious about it, but we didn't, we didn't literally didn't make it to the third pyramid. There were some people that did on uh, early day, the people that came one day early. Yeah. Okay. But you're talking about where you have at the bottom 
a more sophisticated literally on the casing stones than you do as you move up. Yes, that's right. And and then the casing yeah. stones in some cases look a lot like the work you see in Peru. They're kind of pillowy and uh you know there are head notches in them yeah there's notches and and nubs and everything but then we the felt uh, that at the second pyramid i found the second pyramid to be the 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 most impressive of the three yeah right which i believe is um coffer eight but we we just called them one two and three right <laughs> first of all if you're a skeptic about some of the dating, you feel a little funny both calling it khufu's pyramid and then saying yeah. khufu might not have built it right, right yeah and i say might so we call it one, two, and three, but 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 two. A lot of talk from the guides, a lot of talk about you know from people on the trip that that really knew their shit. That it almost gave you the sense that it was older, and obviously, as your listeners will know, and you guys will know, number two is the one that connects to the Sphinx. Yes, right? that's right. Yep. So and why, if the Sphinx is as old as some say it is, why would you build the next pyramid? right over yeah. to the right of it yeah and then build you know, the th second one and then connect later. it to the older structure yeah yeah and, that's and, right yeah and i found the 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 uh, valley temple connected with the sphinx to be much more impressive than all of us might get an impression from afar generally right? yes yeah that, that, that yeah that actually the megalithic construction mostly on the southern side of the sphinx which is its personal temple was incredible the blocks of stone and the 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 arrangement of them and the field that it gave you was more impressive than the pyramids itself wow mm. you know looked at block to block right now of course you walk up out of the valley temple and you look up and see you know a thousand times more stone move <laughs> yeah in the valley temple the stones were larger they were more precisely even in the pyramid itself you know from side to side you could see both sides of it i know there's some question in peru whether you see the front side it's perfectly matched oh yeah it makes sense the back side they left a little loose right but you could see both sides of it in the valley temple and it was absolutely perfect you know 3d architecture of a of a size that was larger than the pyramids itself which you know again just you know totally circumstantially and I believe all the stuff is, I didn't see anything definitive for an ancient civilization, for, you know, precursor civilization, by gosh, nothing definitive. You yeah. Know, I just couldn't get there. But suggestive and circumstantial and just the feeling that it gave you, it tended to support Graham Hancock and Robert Schock's belief that the, the Sphinx um, arrangement was older and also the Khafre pyramid that connects to it with the, 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 the uh, causeway was interesting in itself because it was dug into bedrock and its core is bedrock. When you go into it, you're not climbing through stones in the center. You're climbing through the original bedrock. Yeah. And if, if I've got it straight and when you go behind the pyramid on the Western side, and I, I think, I hope I got some good photos that show this, um, but you're with, you're down 40 feet below bedrock. So before they had to build the pyramid, they had to cut it back into the natural uh, topography, rock, hard rock, for, uh, 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 topology, excuse me, whatever, when I said topography, <laughs> of the, uh, yeah, you had to build it. They built it back in there, but there's no reason they had to do that. Yeah. Unless they had, to, if they moved it 40 meters to the east, it would have gained them 20 years of work. Huh. Why in the world would you build it inset into the bedrock instead of moving it every little bit? You moved it towards the Nile Valley to the east. You'd have gained countless, countless hours of work. Of, of so not having the, of not having to cut out bedrock is basically what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. Hmm. And that had never sunk in on me. I'd seen some vague descriptions of it, probably probably seen good descriptions of it, but it, it didn't really. It, it but it added up there. You're like, holy moly. Yeah, that's you never know, sunk in on well, me either. That's that's great. That's yeah, a great yeah. observation. And I look forward to looking into more people, see what other people have said about that, that have a finer eye than I do, but. 
but uh it's but, it's know, so that was one of the themes that you saw shared it seems like the places where they put them is where they had to go for whatever they were trying to do right it, it, yeah it's it, it yeah, when you when you see it when leans you to the sacred site <laughs> um aspect of things down to meters yeah, yeah. It, it 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 implies yeah. when you see that kind of thing whether it's for that pyramid or any other structure where this is this this these kinds of things are apparent you start to ask why did they do that when they could have put it over here and it's basically in the same area, but they would have had to do way less work. Or why did they decide to do the work this way rather than this other way, which would end up with the same result if it's just a temple or if it's just a tomb or whatever. And you see those kinds right. of things. And that starts to point point you in in the direction of form follows function, which is, yeah. a, which is something we talk about on the show a lot. When you see these kinds of things, it, it, they don't just have no reason for doing that. And then that makes you yeah, start asking, what is the reason, right? You all have done a great job with it. And I, I'm not sure it's the exact words, but it's deliberate precision. Yes. You know, it's precision that's so deliberate that you can't figure out what their thinking was. And we just attribute it to, you know, that they were very precise people. But I, I'm always of mind that people are do things for logical reasons and they're not all mythological or they're just worshiping their God. So we're going to put it 40 meters the wrong way and spend this much time, <laughs> this much effort, because somehow we derive from our religion that we should worship at this location instead of 40 meters to the right. Yeah. Or because yeah. the yeah. Pharaoh, the Pharaoh drew the X on the map right here. And that's where we have yeah. to put it no matter how hard it is. <laughs> that's right. Which is that's the explanation right. you get a lot with Egypt stuff. So. And then, you know, on that same causeway I'm describing between the, the number two pyramid and, the, and the, the Sphinx, we had the good fortune to go into the shaft of Osiris. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, too. Yeah. Is that the video you posted where you're like, okay, that was freaky? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I saw it that. It was freaky. <laughs> yeah. It was freaky. I'm 54 years old. <laughs> fat. You know, it was damn creepy on a personal, physical level, and then creepy on a spiritual and, uh, you know, geomancy level. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it just, you know, th there are shafts all over there, all over the Giza Plateau and everywhere else that we went. They'd say, well, there's a shaft. They say, well, you stuff, what do you think's in that shaft? It says, probably another room. Hmm. You know, there's probably something down there. And and he was just said generally over and this has been going on for thousands of years, they get filled up with sand and trash. Yeah. And then somebody will get the proper permissions, you know, every few decades and go dig out one, just one, of dozens of those shafts. And Zahi Hawass, I think it was in ninety nine, said, uh, well, let's dig this one. Because it was right there on the causeway, but it I don't think it distinguished itself. I don't think it had a grand uh, need to have been nothing that had been contemplated by Napoleon, but not done. They just happened to dig in one. And they got down the thing, goes down damn near 200 feet, has three, 200 feet, excuse me, 200 feet, has three levels, and has the black granite boxes at each level. Hmm. Wow. And, and I, you know, I went down 100 feet on that thing. You know, we all did, but it was it was a little bit spooky. You know, they they don't make you sign any release forms over there. <laughs> There's no like, here's gonna be your belay partner. Um, <laughs> if you say stop, we'll stop. No, it was like, no safe words. <laughs> Straight to pyramid. Yeah, no safe words, <laughs> nothing, you know? And thank God, you know, it was a perfect 72 degrees the entire time we were there. The weather could not have been better, but ah. it had been your typical hot, the way we probably misperceived some of their climate over there. But if it had been 110 degrees, you couldn't have, I don't know how in the world you make it down there, but you climbed all the way down. Then the first level, box, climbed down another, another box, and then, a, and then a, the, the third it was almost like daring you to do it on the tour. You know, we all had to make decisions because it was one at a time. Yeah. You could only go down to that third chamber alone. Oh, and then no. when you got down there alone, there was about maybe two square meters to stand on. If you stood on some rocks, I don't even think I got off the ladder. And I just snagged one picture because you weren't supposed to take any photos throughout that. Now, uh -huh. Jimmy's already kind of busted all that up. You know, Jimmy's. <laughs> yeah. 
completely, you know, I love it, you know, cowboy on it. And um, <laughs> I don't think it'll get anybody in trouble. And I think that stuff should be out there. But we got a lot of video of the Osiris shaft, vastly more than, than anyone has in the past. I took a couple of photos down there, basically, basically of me you know sweating and scared yeah i saw the video <laughs> after you had climbed back up and you're like okay that was freaky <laughs> but the other thing i but wanted to ask is is it yeah. what, did you get the impression because i heard people talking about this mm -hmm. uh the question of how the boxes got down there did they seem to be too big to get down the shaft or is that just a rumor when i looked up the the shafts and there were two or three above you yeah and you're at the bottom I cannot say that you couldn't exactly fit one of those in there. It seemed to be about the size mm. there. The Serapium, it didn't look like they could turn the corners. Yeah. Okay. But why you would not make it two feet wider when you dug that hole to give you some turning room, because you just can't imagine how they could tuck them back there. They were tucked back in the niches in those chambers and again, these aren't perfect. Again, it's a perfect box in an imperfect hole. Yeah. And I don't have the answer, gents and ladies. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I just don't. And I've had to say that around my hometown. You know, you get a lot of friends. Well, is it aliens or is it this? Or, you know, and, and it's just like, man, you know, you got to accept that I give you more information on what a mystery it is. That's so, all you can do. So, oh, yeah. So yeah. they would have had to there, lower the box vertically and then lay it sideways once they got it down in there. That's right. And then somehow jack it perfectly, like taking a couch around a dorm room, you know, thing where you yeah. barely make it around the corner. And I can't even say it wasn't too small. But I couldn't say that is obviously too small to bring it down at that location. Yeah, but it was close. It was it, it, either way. It that's would have been right. a tight. OK, that's that's exactly what I wanted to know, because I've heard people say these boxes are too big. And I'm like, well, all right. One, two, <laughs> well, let's see what three. some of the other people <laughs> right. have. You and know, some of them have more sophisticated tools, you know, and obviously I, my heart was pounding and I wasn't taking any detailed measurements. Right. Right. Of course. Um, but but we we had the tools there to 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 probably get to that actually and 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 show people but there's no reason to believe whatsoever and i don't think even zahi hawass would tell you that those chambers maybe there were other entrances that were larger that they brought them in through yes and, that's it, and was it dark or was it well lit they had strung some you know <laughs> you know 19th century uh, electrical stuff through every place we went yeah. Right. Like somebody had been there before. We didn't go. I guess there were a couple of places. Some people shimmy back. Well, as you can see, a lot of the photos is completely dark. Yeah. But even at that level, there would be other places that are lit. So the main place you would go, they would have had a couple of lights. You know, you're not total exploring, but then you could walk off and this applied to damn near every place. And, and the rest of it would be dark and you would be underground and you'd have to go around with flashlights. And, um, but yeah, now I tell you the bent pyramid of Dashur was our first day. And that was the most significant physical effort. I mean, there were a number of physical efforts here and I went on a dig in 2015 and 2016. I prepared and went and worked out at this, uh, you know, what do you call it? <laughs> the heavy <laughs> lifting kind of, kind of working out. Oh my gosh. You're at a gym. Paleo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Serious gym. I'm just trying You're to doing CrossFit. I got all into it. Yeah, CrossFit. God damn. Excuse me. Yeah, CrossFit. So I got, I went all CrossFit, you know, both times before I went on the, the Jordan thing because I knew I had to dig. It was not near, and I did nothing this time. I was cor totally the Corona couch kid, right? <laughs> I went over there and it, it busted my ass, man. And the Bent Pyramid of Deshur was a great example. 85 meters. No one has been in it since 1950. Wow. They opened it in late 2019, immediately got shut down. There are no turn styles. There's not, not a lemonade stand out there. Nothing. And it's a World Heritage Site. It's the Bent Pyramid. It's the oldest pyramid. Right? And no one's been in it. And we went into that thing. But step one is you had to go down an 85 meter severely inclined shaft so and it's about three feet 
by three feet and I'm six, four. Mm. Right. So yeah, you got a choice. You can either go down backwards or go down forwards and downward dog position, right? <laughs> down you, were, then they got, you were bent more than it, in half, basically. I was bent more than in half. You're worried about your back getting scraped, you know, which I missed. Somebody else scraped the hell out of their back, another big guy. And, but, but, but uh, you, you, you moved yourself down. They had these um, steps, like pieces of wood that were horizontal on a nice slab of wood that went all the way down. So it's all wood all the way down. Then they would have these horizontal slabs, almost like a ladder, but it's not. Yeah. So you kind of go through that. But, you know, 85 meters is like two and a quarter football fields. That's yeah. a long time for it's the a long big guy way, to be man. climbing downward dog, man. <laughs> and you're like kind of nervous about it all. And it, it was just, you know, it was a great adventure. You know, it was a great adventure because <laughs> then you get down there and you're like, thank God I made it. What the hell is inside this pyramid? Wow. And I'll tell you, number one, bats. bats I was going to ask. Yeah. yeah, bats. Yeah. Of course. Bat guano, uh, bats all over the place. Smelled like bats. What about um, snakes? <laughs> no did snakes? Not see any, did not see any snakes. All right. But depicted. Many snakes depicted, gentlemen. Oh, yeah. I would say the two most frequently depicted things were snakes and smoking blue lotus. Ah, is that when you were yeah. yelling out snakes when you were down there? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I guess anybody and and, and the, the and you know it's all true about the resonance. Yeah. And I, I wish I'd gotten and I need to go see. There's one particular place um in the Bent Pyramid. Oh, I believe. But there were multiple places where if you hummed it came back to you like no resonance you'd ever heard in your choir chapel. Right. Wow. Like nothing. We've all heard resonance before and it's yeah. built into a lot of things. I used to work in the U S Capitol and there's a place you could stand and somebody a hundred yards away could hear you when you were whispering and said that, but, but nothing like this was. And that, that ended up culminating uh, like it at Luxor. No, excuse me. At Karnak, there was an alabaster hall. An alabaster is a transparent stone, so you could hold a light up to it and see the light going through the stone. Just beautiful, beautiful, perfect hieroglyphics carved in it. And it just architecturally perfect in every sense and then artistically perfect. And then it was acoustically perfect to top it off. That if you hummed at the right frequency, it overwhelmed the chamber. Whoever hit the right hum, you could hear that person. Uh, but it was so deliberate. And how would you not make a mistake? How do you test that first? Yeah. Do you build it? Do you build it with mud bricks <laughs> and see whether you can get that thing going? Because it would depend on the alabaster and what the alabaster does with sound. How do you know that if you go to all this trouble to build this perfect thing, you would have to throw away so many of them? So many things we saw that you you would have to throw away a lot of them before you got it right. You know, and you wouldn't mm. have computers to model it. You could, you would have to truly do it right the first time, or you would not only go to the tremendous trouble of building whatever you were seeing, but you would have had to have gone to some degree of that trouble many other previous times. Yeah, just mm. to test it. Wow. Man. Well, speaking of that, did you guys visit the uh, trial shafts or whatever they're called? The, the oh yeah, around the pyramid where they were. It looked like they were testing. Uh, the some of the shaft, the the pyramid construction, they 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 are in the Giza plateau or in the area or whatever, but they basically mimic the um the entryway, the descending and ascending passages yeah. of the Great Pyramid. No, but maybe that's what I was hearing from the multiple shafts that we saw around the pyramid. Uh, yeah, maybe I didn't pick up that those had trial trial passages. That, yeah, that, yeah. But but no, the, the the sense I got was exactly as you're speaking, that there were multiple locations around the pyramids that are as yet fully unexplored yes. or fully explored, and but had a relevance. There was also, we went out to, oh God, what is the name of? Maybe it's my doom, but it's where Herodotus said there were 1,500 rooms in a labyrinth. Oh, yeah. Not the one at the, yeah. The labyrinth, yes. Yeah. yeah. And the Germans came through there a few years ago 
and they did GPR, said apparently very legit stuff that some yep. people accepted. They just hadn't got to it yet. And they said, yep, there it's- could easily be 1,500 rooms there. You've got the sense. And again, this is just gut. This is sense. What not? Take it for what you will. But you got the sense that there was a tremendous amount of unexplored territory there. Yeah. Like at any time, you could literally stumble upon, you know, same or for saying it, but 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 a library of Alexandria. Yes. Where there truly could be great work still hiding from us because they were so so careful. And and I tell you you know, just to click through some of the myths about Egypt and things I may believe that are contrary. And you guys probably agree too. the, the pyramids weren't tombs. Right. And you know, my first thing with my peeps at home, when they're saying, well, what's the deal over there, George, you know, is that, well, first thing you need to know is no pyramid contains a hieroglyphic and no hieroglyphic depicts a pyramid. That's a good so point. If you, yeah. if you just start from there. <laughs> yeah. For glyphics everywhere. There are tombs everywhere. It's going through beautifully decorated tombs of dead pharaohs, the, the Valley of the Kings alone. Yeah. Right? And and then you look at all that art. Not once did anyone bother to depict their greatest accomplishment. There are no hieroglyphs of pyramids. Hmm. And then you go inside the pyramids that are supposed to be the tombs for one or two, you know, 13 of these guys. Sennefri did four of them, supposedly. So maybe there are five pyramid builders out of 600 kings that just happen to pop up and build these, you know, totally different <laughs> Giant kind of triangles. Tombs, yeah. Totally different kind of tombs. And then they didn't put any art in them like any of the rest of the guys and girls did. Yeah. They didn't, you know, and they did something totally different. And it had properties and so, you know, the Valley of the Kings, it's all, it's a big chamber, square hall, goes down into the thing. You got the, the sarcophagus. It, there's a tribute to him all around you. That's where that Pharaoh was buried. Right. Then you go to these, you know, dozen other places that were supposedly Pharaoh's buried. And, uh, and of course, that what I was just describing, Valley of the Kings, all of that is just intensely artistic that you can't look at a part of any wall that doesn't tell you a story about him or his time. Mm. But then you go into the grandest constructions of all, and they depict nothing about who made them. Weird. Yeah. yeah. Very weird. Very weird. Yes. Did you guys get to the Temple of Hathor? Did you make it out we there? We did. Yeah? What was that like? We, we, we did um, at Dendera, right? Yes, yeah, the Dendera, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the the Ptolemaic Temple um, had, I did not make it down to the light bulb. Right. (laughs) I stayed short of that. uh, It's a pretty narrow uh, hallway. (laughs) Well, it was narrow, and I'd already been down another narrow hallway. I'd already (laughs) climbed through this thing that I barely made it out of, and this poor lady from Canada literally barely made it out of. Wonderful folks, but I mean, us older folks, it was like, it was tough. Yeah. And then I got out of this particular thing. They said, oh, now here's where you get out and see the blight bulb. I said, I wish I had done that. But no, it seemed to have a subterranean. Uh, it seemed to have a subterranean precursor ah, to it. It did. Yeah. But, but it was all decorated. Right. So either somebody came in later and, and chipped the rest of the stuff below it. Um but, you know, it had all the, and I look forward to, I sent a bunch of pictures to Randall Carlson all right. um, that, that he had asked for, called him for, I went, went out there and said, hey, you missed any Egypt stuff that I could get? And he said, yeah, please take picture, pictures, photos of the Dendera ceilings and the the Z- Zodiac stuff there. Yes. Which it all is. Yeah. And I have no, you know, I'm not, I can't interpret it. And I look forward to whatever uh, Randall gets out of it, but there's some mysteries associated with it. And those were the Pharaonic kings, uh, excuse me, the Ptolemaic pharaohs, you know. Yep. And this is another good thing, good takeaway. He said, post it for some of your listeners. But again, what I'm sharing around town here in Raleigh and <laughs> things to know about Egypt are that when those Ptolemaic kings and Cleopatra, okay, and uh, 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 Caesar and Mark Antony and and uh, Alexander the Great, I'm covering about five, 600 years there, right? Yep. But all these great people of, of, you know, antiquity, 
that, that were intensely involved with Egypt in really in Egypt of the Pharaohs. They still had hieroglyphics. They were still building massive stuff. There was still a continuation of the earlier days. We are closer in time to Cleopatra than Cleopatra is to the people that built the pyramids. Right. Even in the mainstream two thousand years ago, yeah. yeah, that's right. Even in the mainstream, that's a, it's that's exactly what you should have said. I would have said it myself. <laughs> Even in the mainstream, the first thing you got to get is that your old Romans and ancient Greeks and 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 even relatively modern Egyptians were looking at ruins of stuff that was older than we are to those people. Yeah, so they were mystified too, and that's just always a good thing to keep in mind about Egypt. How much time you're dealing with? Yeah. That's that's true. I got I have a question about one more site. Uh, yeah. You guys went to the unfinished obelisk, right? We did. What did you think about that? What was your impression there? <clears throat> well, we ain't going to finish it anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great answer. Because <laughs> I don't think we got the two. Somebody is going to have to look into that one, man. Yeah. I mean, you know... <laughs> You could take the diorite ball stones, and we did, and bang them, the harder stone, and bang them on that, um, I guess that would have been Aswan and not Aswan granite. Yeah, it's yeah. a pink granite. Yeah, it's a pink granite. Okay, it is. You could get some a little bit of purchase with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. You could knock it, but it didn't make sense the way that <laughs> the little ripples of they're not cut marks, but obviously the effort that was being made to cut the Asquan unfinished obelisk, if it was with the diorite, with the balls, and you were banging the balls, it wouldn't, we couldn't figure out, I don't think anyone's ever figured out, why it would look like it does today. Yeah. That it scoops smoothly. And 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 um, Scott and Lizzie, who were kind of took over the LIDAR stuff, God bless them, hopefully they don't make it all proprietary, <laughs> But they scanned all of that, and then they told us later that every one of those scoop marks was about 51 centimeters apart. Oh, wow. Uh, They're all very uniform. Now, if you're down there banging, and I don't believe slaves did this. You know, that's another yeah. takeaway from Egypt, that, that all that stuff we grew up with about slaves did it all. Very convenient answer. But it's very – you would have had to have so many slaves that one-tenth of the population couldn't have controlled the rest. You would have had to have a much larger country. I don't know if y'all have ever heard that. Right. But you can't just say 200,000 slaves worked on the pyramids because in no time in history has, you know, 10,000 people ruled over 200,000. The slaves would have revolted. In order to have 200,000 slaves, you need 200,000 masters hmm. or damn near. Yeah. Right. And I haven't read up on that scholarship, but that intrigued me. That they just said that, 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 and there are other reasons too to believe that these people were working voluntarily to some respect. Yeah, exactly. And working while the Nile flooded. Remember, the Nile was flooding for three months a year. You had to pick up and move to exactly where all this stuff is being built uphill. Outside yeah, I've of heard that. Yeah, I've heard that one. That's right. That's, that's a good right. point. So they're coming out voluntarily. And oh, I lost my track there. Which part were you we talking well, about? Well, the saying, LIDAR oh, scan. Finished a bliss. Yeah. 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 The, 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 the bliss, if you were in there banging it out, it it was just hard to match up with what you saw. Not that I know the tool that they were using, but it didn't seem to be the same thing we were doing, banging the balls on the granite, but the it did give way. You could bang it hard enough. Right. That it would crush you it. take one thing. Yeah. yeah, but then, and you can just look at my photos, you know, um, if people want to go there, it's just hard to, you know, to explain in words exactly. But there's a ripple where it was like one person would have had to work their way all the way through it and stay within their 51 centimeters and another person beside them. But it mm. actually would have had to have been hundreds and hundreds of people. And you think it would have ended up looking uniform, right? Yeah. Not like there was a scoop here, a scoop here, a scoop here, a scoop here. It looks right. like mm. ice cream scoop. Yeah, like somebody was shoveling the rock out is what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In almost an instant. Yeah. But and, that that, um, that pattern is like an indication of uh of the the workings of a tool. Yeah, it's witness marks. Like uh, or a process that, that 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 isn't adequately described by someone just taking the ball, but perhaps yeah. uh, you know. Um, I'll say in, in like fashion, 
when you look at the boxes of the Serapium, it's just oddball stuff that you see. But when you look at the, the granite boxes and you can see pictures on my link, um, some of them had scoops out of them, multiple scoops. Yeah. Perfectly smooth, conca concave scoops. And you're like, how does it get damaged like that? That's obviously damage. They're random looking. There might be a dozen of them on the box, you know, some two feet long, some three inches long. But they're all these kind of similar type scoops. And you're like, well, nobody dropped it and it made a perfect little <laughs> scoop out of it. <laughs> yeah. How the hell does that happen? How does it get damaged? And then you can take that damaged stuff all the way up to the Ramesseum, you know, after the Valley Valley of the Kings, you know, you're driving back to the Colossi Memnon, you know, stuff beside the road. You pull off the road, you're in the Ramesseum, and there's a statue of Ramesses of which only is left is everything from kind of his breast up. And if you follow the math out, it was over 1,200 tons. Wow. Where the hell is the rest of them? And how did they break him in half? <laughs> <laughs> you know, wow. I mean, you know, a lot of it's quarried. You know that for thousands of years, people went to the sites and took advantage of other people having taken the stone out of the ground. Yeah. And they took it out and they knocked it out and they beat it up and they did blocks into smaller blocks and went and used it for their own purposes. But nobody split a 1,200-ton statue in half yeah. so they could quarry it. You would beat pieces off of it, right? Right. How do you break them in half? And then you see things everywhere like that. How did it all get destroyed like this? And how many times? Yeah. Man, so that, that's that, fascinating. Yeah, so that brings me to the final question. As a younger Dryas uh, catastrophe you know, uh, advocate... What is your takeaway from that? Do you think that we see signs of massive catastrophe in some of these very ancient structures? I'm fascinated now by, <clears throat> I've been looking up and making my eyes bleed in the last week, trying to <laughs> get a feel for the wild Nile theory that it seems to be well-established. And I hadn't found the papers I want to find. I don't know where, I hadn't quite gotten to the bottom of it, but it is well-established in mainstream science that the Nile was up to 50 and 60 meters deep, deeper than it is today. And that exact time, Robert Schock and, and Graham and the rest of them say that you're showing that erosion. See, I used to picture it as erosion coming from the, uh, I didn't really think it was the Nile. Yeah. Right. Are we but talking now about? I've come to think that it was actually flooding of the Nile that if they're right, did leave those erosional marks on the Sphinx where oftentimes they'll talk about it must have been a lot of rain yeah but the rain isn't going to wipe that away the Nile moving past it for a period of a couple of thousand years 50 meters deep on and off on and off would have dug that out right mm -hmm. and I think it also could have deposited like the sediment around the uh, Assyria right yeah and that's why it was found underground and the Temple of Osiris was found mostly above ground. That you find this greater architecture is always buried. Yeah. Did they were they not proud of their buildings and built them above ground? Why is the larger stuff always buried? Or or might we be wrong? Or might the perhaps the geologists are just right? But they just, I don't see enough investigation of could some of that be sedimentation from a time of much higher flows and and dramatic catastrophic events. And then just as far as shaking it all apart, you see so much. It's not supposed to be a, a seismically active area, particularly. Yeah. But it looks like somebody shook the shit out of it a thousand times, you know, <laughs> over 10,000 years. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And I, I, guys, you know where it is with me. And I thought about it before going on the show because I, I try to come out of it and I did a blog on the cosmic cusp, which is my blog. And yep. I've got one on Egypt and I said, you know, I'm going to stick to my, my lane, which is trying to add to the proof or communicate the proof for the younger grass catastrophe. Then the question is, why do you get out of your lane and get into ancient Egypt and all that? Well, first of all, it's just interesting as hell, but what makes me believe that is not the saw marks or the perfect boxes. It's what they said themselves. They said, and I've become to respect, and I know you guys have too, because I've listened to so much of what you've said, that these ancient cultures, they didn't all say the same thing, and that's not an accident. 
and that's not some kind of Jungian archetype. Right. It's an actual witness report. If you ask the Egyptians what where they came from, we came from people long before us that survived the great cataclysm and communicated to us certain arts that we're trying to do our best to maintain. Yes. You don't need to tell me anymore. I believe the ancient cultures. And then I'm trying to find evidence, hard evidence, scientific evidence that those myths are true. But I'm 10, 15 years past, 20 years past, questioning what those people said. It's too consistent. It's too regular. It fits with so much of the hard evidence, perhaps not precisely in Egypt. We haven't found, you know, the, the stone that shows us it shook apart 13,000 years ago. But I, but I believe what those people said. <laughs> yes. You know, well said. I, I, I'll, I'll take their word for it. So is that good enough for science? Hell no. That's <laughs> your interpretation of myth. But but it's good enough for me. And um, we'll, you know, me and the snakes and all the rest of us will find better <laughs> evidence moving forward to convince those skeptards and assholes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well put. Yes. yes. Well said. So, yeah, everybody should visit CosmicTusk.com. That's your blog, right? You post there mostly about younger, right. mostly about younger Dryas stuff, also about uh, life in space. Great articles there about that right. stuff. Well, it kind of got hijacked this year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's tenth year, and it's tenth year. It busted away to to uh, disease from space, and I still appreciate y'all having Chandra with promising on. Uh, yeah, yeah. There are a number of developments in that field, but we need not touch them now, gentlemen. Not now, but yes, I would love to speak to Dr. Wakramasinghe again at some point. So we're going to have to. Y'all did a great thing having him on. I still appreciate it. Yeah. Well, thank you yeah, so much we for, appreciate it too, yeah, for organizing that. That was a mind bending episode. Absolutely. It was great. Uh, hey, I'll add one other thing. Uh, I'm glad I remember this. Um, your cohort, Randall Carlson, did a live uh, stream with us. Oh, you? yeah. That's right. That was wonderful, man. And I just want to thank Randall if he hears this that um, we booted it up as over there. Everybody, you know, love Randall, love you guys. Uh, I mean, some real fans. And I said, Hey, I think I can get Randall Carlson. Yeah. And we had him come on and all piled into Ben's room. And we had about 22, 23 of us all in the single room and had Randall on live. And it actually technically worked. All right. We were able yeah, to hear him and talk and everybody asked questions. It was really, really neat. I uh, saw pictures awesome. of that. I saw that on too. On Twitter. Yeah. It, yeah. Everybody yeah. piled up in the hotel room. That was really awesome. Yeah. That. And I got other video of us listening to the snakes in the bus as yeah. we're driving along <laughs> here in the Delta. Yeah. I saw that too. Yeah. That's great, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah. And all of your support, George. And uh, we support you and all of your work, you know. So we Absolutely, really appreciate man. it. And, and the, the to get the, you know, the, the, your impressions of Egypt has been just really great. Thank you. Yeah. So much. Thank you for We're your terrific. energy. I'm, I'm no expert, but it's fun to share my experience. Thank None you. of us are experts. Yeah. Yeah. So that's right, buddy. All right, man. Thank Snakes. you so much. Snakes. 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 <laughs> Snakes. gentlemen brothers of the serpent podcast that was a fantastic interview with george but this is one of those shows where uh, there's, there's time travel happening so we were we talked to george and then we went back and did the first segment and now we're doing the last segment Open the snake bros christmas which yeah. my mind is still blown from doing that yes and the uh it's i the 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 mind blowing is happening in such a way that i can't figure out because they're sort of overlapping, mind-blowing yeah, aspects. Yeah, that's right. Egypt, the and, fossils from from Tibet, and the you know the 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 flag, and just the the pyramid with the to the toilet paper guy, <laughs> the kitty blanket, the kitty blanket, the warm and fuzzy for the warm and fuzzy, the jam, yes, and all the jam that I can't eat. That the pregnant lady will eat mm. all of it, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, pyramids in general. Um, that's right. And the the discussion with George was great. Um, and the time travel happens flawlessly. That's right. Well, zero mistakes. Zero, zero mistakes. mistakes going and on. Speaking here. of pyramids, 
I have a story here from The Guardian. Oh, yes. I didn't want to bring this up to George because I didn't know, uh, I didn't want to get it sidetracked from his stories, but uh, this is pretty cool. Lost artifact from Great Pyramid of Giza found in a cigar box in Aberdeen. A lost artifact from the Great Pyramid of Giza, one of only three objects ever recovered from inside the last remaining wonder of the ancient world, has been found in a chance discovery at the University of Aberdeen. Curatorial assistant Abir Eladini, I don't know how to say her name, originally from Egypt, was reviewing items in the university's Asia collection when she came across a cigar box marked with her country's former flag. Inside, she found several wooden splinters, uh, which she then identified as a fragment of wood from the Great Pyramid, which has been missing for more than a century. The university's collections are vast, running to hundreds of thousands of items, so looking for it has been like finding a needle in a haystack. Mm. I couldn't believe it when I realized what was inside this innocuous-looking cigar tin, she said. The wooden fragment is one of a trio of items discovered by engineer uh, Wayman Dixon inside the pyramid's queen's chamber in 1872. Known as the Dixon relics, two of them, a ball and a hook, are housed in the British Museum. While some have speculated the lost piece of cedar was part of a measuring rule which could reveal clues to the pyramid's construction. It is believed the fragment was bequeathed to the university by Dixon's friend James Grant, but was never classified and despite an extensive search could not be located. The discovery of the relic has also raised new questions as carbon dating has shown that the wood can be dated to the period 3,341 to 3,094 BC, yeah. some 500 years earlier than historical records which date the Great Pyramid to the reign of the Pharaoh Khufu in 2580 to 2560 BC. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Wait a minute. What historical records date <clears throat> the bill? Yeah. Yes, anyway. yes, yes, right, yes, right, yes, right. yes, 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 yes. Everything you want to say, agreed. <laughs> <laughs> Neil Curtis, head of museums and special collections at the university, said, Finding the missing Dixon relic was a surprise, but the carbon dating has also been quite a revelation. It is even older than we had imagined. This may be because the date relates to the age of the wood. Right. Maybe from a scrimp turn, scrimp turn, scrimp turn of a long lived tree. <laughs> Alternatively, it could have scrimped it because the rarity of trees in ancient Egypt, which meant that the wood was scrimped hard, <laughs> treasured and recycled and cared for over many scrimps. <laughs> it will now be for scholars to debate its use and whether it was deliberately de uh, deposited, as happened later during the New Kingdom, when pharaohs tried to emphasize continuity with the past by having antiquities scripted within them. The cedar fragment originally belonged to a much larger piece of wood. Yes. <clears throat> Which was most recently seen in a 1993 exploration of the interior of the pyramid by a robotic camera hidden na uh, in hidden and now unreachable voids. Yeah. Why are they now unreachable? Well, we, you can't actually go in them personally, I think is what that they're trying to say. Okay, they're okay. Reachable now reachable by robotic, in other words, but you can't. Gotcha, gotcha. But since the construction of the pyramid, yeah. physically they're unreachable by now. people. Yeah, I gotcha. Eladani, the, the woman who discovered the, uh, the artifact in the museum, the curator, she says, I'm an archaeologist and have worked on digs in Egypt, but I never imagined it would be here in northeast Scotland that I'd find something so important to the heritage of my own country. Yeah. It may be just a small fragment of wood, which is now in several pieces, but it is hugely significant given that it is one of only three items ever to be recovered from inside the Great Pyramid. Right. So, do you do you know the what the artifact we're talking about here and what the whole deal is with this? No. It's okay. part of the hook handle rod. That's right. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> that's what we call it. It's like, okay. In the Queen's in the King's Chamber, there are quote unquote air chef, star chef, whatever they are. And and so when you're in the King's Chamber, there's these little squares on the uh, north and south walls I think it's north and south and they go up and out and they're you know they're like eight inches square there's little tiny holes but they go all the way out to the exterior of the pyramid and where these shafts exit from the king's chamber on the exterior of the pyramid have been found right and they're it, so they recently they built a, a 
like they built a fan in one of them to pull air in and, and sort of keep the place aired out. Okay. Okay. Down in the queen's chamber below the king's chamber, it didn't have any holes in the walls. So the granite walls were just solid. But this guy, Dixon, <clears throat> was looking at the king's chamber one and was like, mm, I wonder. So he was kind of tapping around the walls in the queen's chamber and he got to some spots and he heard like a hollow sound. And he took a chisel basically and dug his way through and found two shafts there oh. that were never finished out all the way into the chamber. Okay. And these shafts could never be found exiting anywhere on the exterior of the pyramid. Right? Okay. So the question was, is where did they go? And what were they for? First of all, the ones up, up in the king's chamber being called air shafts or, uh, or whatever, they could serve as air shafts because they went all the way out and they mm -hmm. came all the way into the chamber. But down, down in the queen's chamber, they never finished them all the way into the chamber. So they can't be air shafts. Right. And the question is, what are they for? If they don't if they don't go into the chamber that they're aimed at and they never leave the pyramid either, what are they doing? Where are they going? What are they for? Yeah. But when Dixon broke through, he reported that a stone ball and a metal hook with a piece of, of wood came out of one of the shafts. Oh. And later when people were when Gantenbrink was exploring with his robot, he got up one of the queen's shaft with the robot and, and saw <clears throat> the remnants of the cedar, of pieces of cedar wood, and also a metal rod that Dixon had apparently jammed up in there, trying to knock something loose. Okay. Okay. So Dixon probably didn't open the shafts and have those things. Maybe the stone ball fell out, but he probably got the hook and the pieces of wood from jamming his metal rod up in there. Oh. And then his metal rod got stuck, and what he did was unscrewed the last piece and then just left the rest of it in there because he couldn't get it out. Okay. So what they're saying in that article is interesting because the idea is, is how could this have been put in there later by someone else? Okay. Right. So the idea that this isn't original to the larger pyramid structure when the shaft is closed at both ends <laughs> until Seems very to, recently yeah. and yeah. that the, indicates and that, that it was put there while the pyramid was being built. Right. So the dating at 500 years earlier than they think the pyramid was built is interesting. Number one, it puts it as not, it's not like 12,000 years old or 10,000 years old. But number two, it's also older. It's too old to be dynastic. Basically, that puts it in pre-dynastic times. I'm pretty sure. Uh, the other thing that it could indicate is that those shafts do come out somewhere or there is they, a way to access the shafts from somewhere else. Yeah, so that's the other possibility is those shafts exit into a completely unknown <clears throat> complex of chambers. other chambers yeah. in the pyramid. But the king's chamber and the queen's chamber were built at the same time? No, well... We don't know. The queen's chamber is definitely below the king's chamber and is part... It, it, you can get to uh, both chambers by going through the same passageways. <clears throat> but is, it's there, actually the king's chamber is up higher in the pyramid itself than the queen's chamber is. Is there a theory that the king's chamber with its shafts going out was like a power plant, something about electricity or? Do yeah, I, that's a possibility. Yeah, I've, I guess I heard that on Snake Bros. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so then there being shafts down there on the queens may go into that theory, possibly. Yes. Maybe? Yeah. Yeah. That those those part of that. There's plenty of theories on what the shafts are really for. Okay. And, you know, Chris Dunn went through his power plant ideas and tried to incorporate every aspect that's known about the pyramid right. into that. Including all four of the shafts. Including the items found in the shafts. Yeah. I okay. mean, he even tried to okay. tried yeah. to come up with some ideas of okay, why so there would be. This is a new element. Thrown the in fact that, though. well, see, this, this fragment of wood. It's that an been, old element. Th they knew that it, the fragment of wood was taken out of the pyramid, but it was lost. Yeah. Okay. They didn't know where it was, and now it would just be recently been found, and then they carbon dated it. So that's where the controversy is now. It's mm -hmm. like, wait a minute, how does it's how too is this old? Five hundred years older than when the Egyptologists say the pyramid was actually built, and the the you know the scurptards are like, oh, it, was it was a really old ruler <laughs> <laughs> that they were still using because you know they respected uh, really old things and uh, right, yeah, yeah, they're they're claiming that it's. That the wood was already 500 years old when they were using it to build a pyramid somehow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's another mystery. Yeah. 
Yes, but I also think it's interesting on the other, you know, on the other end, because what we're we're looking at, you know, is the alternate ideas. Well, if those shafts are have been closed off since the building of the pyramid, and that wood was in one of those shafts up until the point to where it was open in modern times, modern ish, eighteen hundreds, then the pyramid isn't that old. Right. Unless somehow the because this is the other problem. Well, he chiseled away at the opening on the inside to get to it. Yeah. But do we know anything about the spot that he chiseled away at? Yeah, it was solid granite. Yeah. Just like the rest, like everything the, else. The yeah. blocks, the interior blocks of the queen's chamber were just solid all the way to the floor. And he basically cut through a block that was okay. placed there by the builders. Okay, gotcha. But the builders had, had on the back side of the block, right? So if you're standing in the room, the, the part you can touch is the front of the block. Mm-hmm. The back side is the one that you can't see that's in that's in the structure. Mm-hmm. They had cut the shaft almost all, almost the, way all the way through, but left like five inches-ish of granite. In, yeah. So they actually continue the shaft into the wall block, but never finished it all the way out into yeah. the chamber. It's a huge on purpose. Yeah. yeah, they yeah, did this on purpose. It was not clearly accident. deliberate. We need the answer. And yeah. so this, this wood came from one of those shafts. <clears throat> so like Kyle said, the possibilities are either there's a whole other complex of rooms and, and passageways that allow for access to the other ends of these shafts, and yeah. that's how the wood got in. And then it could be... Uh, put in there later. Yeah. Uh, because it does look like somebody, it looks, looks like a tool, it right? It's like he was trying to do something with it. Yeah. It, it kind of looks like the same thing as Dixon's steel rod. He's like shoving yeah. it do up you there. Have the picture but there? the other people are putting a wooden shaft down a tunnel to yes. try to find out where it goes. Yeah. And Dixon was yeah. Dixon was shoving a metal rod with a hook on one end up the shaft. and it, And this is a wooden rod with a hook on one end that it looks like it had been shoved down the shaft. Which is why Kyle and I, when we were talking about this, we joked about calling it the hook handle rod. Johnson was trying to retrieve his, his you know, his, <laughs> his diorite ball. ball that he had dropped down the shaft. And then he dropped the because handle rod. If, if you're building the pyramid from the ground up and you get past the, the queen's chamber and you've got the shaft already started uh-huh. and it's 200 feet long and you're near the top of the pyramid and then you drop something down the yeah. shaft and then the shaft is already embedded in the structure yep. and doesn't end out in the bottom of the room, how are you going to get your, you know, yeah. your, you're gonna your diorite ball? You're going to try to start fishing it out with... Yeah, yeah. Johnson Where's your where's your pounding stone? Can I see the picture? So uh, there's it was just a picture of the fragment. Oh, okay. So the other problem with the dating is that it's been in storage uh, since the 1800s, which is before long before they had any carbon dating. So you know, I, I just I'd be interested to see the publications on this and how they try to account for any possible contamination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was in a cigar tin. Of course, it was in a cigar tin. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. That's a mystery. Yeah. So I got another. This is a cool story. Um, Kind of along the same lines. uh, Ancient artifacts. Uh, This is from New York Post. Hmm. British Indiana Jones claims the legendary Holy Grail is in England. Ah. Did you see this one? I saw uh, something that somebody had talked about. A British department into yes draining something. Okay, yes, yeah. an amateur archaeologist dubbed the British Indiana Jones <laughs> claims the world's greatest relic is hidden in a secret crypt in Hounslow, West London. Barry John Bower, forty, <laughs> believes the Knights Templar <laughs> captured <laughs> believes the Knights Templar captured the Holy Grail during the Crusades and brought it back to a crypt secreted away by a weir at the man-made Duke of Northumberland's River according to The Sun. Bauer spent the last few years studying the Templars and was so convinced he has received permission from the Environment Agency, which will divert the river so that they can bring in special equipment to survey the riverbed. Wow. The archaeological enthusiast has invested thousands of dollars into his own ground-penetrating radar equipment to prove his theory early next year. When I find it, (laughs) it's going to be one of the greatest finds in history. The biggest discovery of mankind, he told the sun. <laughs> now I've been in the water, it's made me more certain. It feels hollow. It feels right. Mm. There's something underneath. Why not Hounslow? The legend has it that the grail, the cup Jesus drank from at the Last Supper, holds immeasurable power and has been sought throughout the centuries by man, including treasure hunters, archaeologists, and zenunces. <laughs> 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 yeah, dude, he got permission to 
divert so the river. He's, he's convinced someone that he may be onto something. Yeah. Even if it's not the grail. There's something. There may be something. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Did a lot of research on the Templars, and he's like, yeah. it's under the river, dude. Yeah. <laughs> that's really awesome. <laughs> Good luck, buddy. Yeah. I hope you find something I here hope if it's you not find the grail. Something. Yeah. And then I got uh, I got two more that are just they could be pretty short here. This is uh, this is kind of off topic, but more last couple of episodes. I just thought this was kind of funny. So first story: Venus used to be like Earth. Then climate change happened. <laughs> <laughs> Venus is a very strange place, totally uninhabitable, except for perhaps in the clouds some 60 kilometers up, where the recent discovery of phosphine may suggest floating microbial life. But the surface is totally inhospitable. However, Venus once likely had an Earth-like climate, according to recent climate modeling. Hmm. For much of its history, Venus had surface temperatures similar to present-day Earth. It likely also had oceans, rain, perhaps snow, maybe continents and plate tectonics, and even more speculatively, perhaps even surface life. So they go on to describe how the climate dramatically changed, a runaway greenhouse effect, and they're thinking about this volcanism pumped all this CO2 into the atmosphere, and then everything got really hot. Yeah. Um, and so just about that... Uh, I found out that this area in the atmosphere, 60 kilometers up. Yeah. Is, Where the swamp gas is supposed yeah, to be. <laughs> it's about the same temperature as Earth, Earth temperatures. Yeah. But it's also the same atmospheric pressure, pressure. Right. as Earth, as, you know, yeah. as one atmosphere. atmosphere of Earth. Yeah. And then way down on the surface where it's extremely hot, it's way higher pressure. Of course. Okay, so but but that's an aside. That's not why I brought this okay, story up. Right. That's just totally an aside. <laughs> but basically, you know, according to climate models, Venus used to be like Earth. And then I have another story. Ancient Earth had a thick, toxic atmosphere like Venus <laughs> until it cooled off and became livable. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So wait, <laughs> Inspector so, Johnson, I feel like we're going around in circles. <laughs> <laughs> what are the dates on these stories? How far apart are they? Uh, this one's three days ago. Um, the other one, December 15th. <laughs> okay. Totally different sources. <laughs> it's just ridiculous, people. <laughs> no, no, just. <laughs> So we used to be like Venus, and Venus used to be like us, and then we both changed, we and now we're, and now we're like Venus used to be, and Venus <laughs> yeah, is like yeah, now we're we like early Venus, and Venus is like <laughs> early Earth. This is, come on, what is going on? So that's all I got. <laughs> Thanks for that, babe. Yeah. Those are great. You're welcome. So uh, I have more pyramid stuff here uh, that was sent to us by a listener. But I also want to, about the previous episode, 178, where I kind of went off on astrophysics, two thi or one thing I want to say is, I, and I always do this, it's Proxima Centauri. It's yeah. the name of the star. I always say Alpha Proxima or something like that. Oh, I always okay. get it wrong. It's, you know, the Alpha Centauri is the system. Alpha Centauri is the system. The, the yeah. system. Proxima Centauri is the star. So, uh, and you mentioned last episode when we were talking about exoplanets that they had discovered one that had radio signals. That's yeah. that's the planet that's going around that star. Yes, that's what. So you're not about. only is this there's an Earth-like habitable rocky world there. I think there's they said that there's two worlds there that they've seen. So there's not just one, but there's at least one Earth-like, and it's it's not one of these ones that's like three times Earth's mass. It's actually really close in terms of size to Earth, I think. Uh, but it's also. This system, I, you, I wouldn't say the planet, but this system is the one that has the anomalous radio, radio waves. waves coming from it. But they're also s still trying to find out, uh, is it possible that this is a local source? You know, The interesting thing about it is, is that it, it's in a bandwidth that is very unusual for us to have That's made. right. Yeah, that's right. It's in a bandwidth that's very unusual. It's, it's not used here yeah. much. And... Uh, it's not a whole lot out in space either. So it's, it's, you know, yeah. it's an empty bandwidth in general. So they're ch still trying to find out if, if it was locally sourced. In other words, if some, somehow it was picked up, uh, picked up an earth broadcast. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not sure that that's going to be the case. 
But also, they finally decoded. It'll be like -na 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 -na. <laughs> today on Proxima Centauri. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exoplanet around the nearest star found. <laughs> Seems to be radio waves em emanating from it as well. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I wanted to say those things. And um, anything else? No. Oh, I can't remember. Uh, oh, yeah, the other thing I was going to... The other thing that I forgot last... It was this yeah. weird... There's this weird fact about this expansion stuff. And uh, about the expansion of the universe. That they're saying that this means that the universe is flat. And that, that, that just makes me laugh. <laughs> Of course, because I'm like, oh, flat universe. Yeah. <laughs> if you have a flat universe, the Earth also has to be flat. I mean, you can't really, come on, right? Flat Earth wasn't good enough. We have but to yeah, expand what, that. Time. What they mean about flat universe is that space is flat in the sense as that it isn't. As opposed to curved. As opposed to uh, curved, which is what they were kind of expecting. So this unexpected acceleration indicates flat space time as opposed to curved space time, and that's uh, strange. And I don't really know what that means exactly, but... I just know that flat universe is a surprising development. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we have flat earthers, flat people universe. who believe in flat universe. What are we going to call those people? Well, I mean, the universe is flat. Okay. Physicists have confirmed this. Okay. The standard candle shows. It's flat all the way it's down. It's flat all I the mean, way across. I mean, I've heard this, <laughs> it's been confirmed thing before. <laughs> so... Hey man, we're just we're just reading from the <laughs> manual for how the universe works, final edition. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, this is also from the Guardian. Uh, revealed Isaac Newton's attempts to unlock secret code of pyramids. Unpublished uh -huh. notes show he believed ancient structures held the key to the apocalypse. Ooh. So he is the mathematician who laid the foundations of classical physics, formulated the laws of motion and the law of gravity, and the remains and remains the epitome of the age of reason. But Isaac Newton's secret obsessions with alchemy and obscure branches of theology, which only came to light 200 years after his death, reveal another side to the man who helped shape the modern world. Unpublished notes showing Newton's attempts to unlock codes hidden in the Bible and determine the timing of the apocalypse are now being sold. Uh, three pages of scribblings on the Egyptian pyramids, which Newton believed held the key to profound secrets, are expected to fetch hundreds of thousands of pounds when online bidding closes on Tuesday. In a variation on The Dog Ate My Homework, these notes are scorched from a fire apparently caused by Newton's hound, Diamond, who jumped upon the table and tipped over a standard candle. <laughs> <laughs> These are really fascinating papers because in them you can see Newton trying to work out the secrets of the pyramids. Gabriel Heaton uh, Sotheby, is that how you say that? Uh, Sotheby, Sotheby, it's an uh, auction place, I think. Manuscript specialist told the observer, it's a wonderful conf confluence of bringing together Newton and these great objects from classical antiquity which have fascinated people for thousands of years. The papers take you remarkably quickly straight to the heart of a number of the deepest questions Newton was investigating. And they've got some pictures of the burnt notes. No, that's cool. Newton studied the pyramids from the, in the 1680s during a period of self-imposed scholarly exile at a manor in Lincolnshire, uh, Lincolnshire, away from his base at Cambridge University, following criticism of his work by his rival Robert Hooke of the Royal Society. Newton was trying to uncover the unit of measurement used by those constructing the pyramids. He thought it was likely that the ancient Egyptians had been able to measure the earth and that by unlocking the cubit of the Great Pyramid, he too would be able to measure the circumference of the earth. Oh my gosh. Wow. He hoped that this would lead him to other ancient measures, allowing him to uncover the architecture and dimensions of the Temple of Solomon the setting of the apocalypse, and interpret the Bible's hidden meanings. He was trying to find proof for his theory of gravitation, but in addition, the ancient Egyptians were thought to have held the secrets of alchemy that have since been lost. Today, these seem to be disparate areas of study, but they didn't seem that way to Newton in the 17th century. Newton kept his obsession with alchemy and his religious beliefs a rejection of the doctrine of the Trinity to himself. This was not because he feared his faith might discredit his scientific work or vice versa, but because his unorthodox views would cost him his career. Although his reputation rested on his mathematical and scientific discoveries, 
To Newton, these were secondary to his greater studies in alchemy and theology. Uh, a cache of manuscripts on these subjects surfaced in 1936. Some of them were bought by the uh, economist and Newton devotee John Maynard Keynes, who described Keynes. Keynes, who described his hero as the last of the magicians. So Heaton says the idea of science being an alternative to religion is a modern set of thoughts. Newton would not have believed that his scientific work could undermine religious belief. He was not trying to disprove Christianity. This is a man who spent a long time trying to establish the likely time period for the biblical apocalypse. And this is why he was so interested in the pyramids. Uh, so N Newton's or he princip uh, Principia Mathematica, published in 1687, cemented his yeah, I think status. It's Principia, yeah. Yeah. Uh, cemented his status as a scientific superstar. The culmination of decades of work and thought, the magnum opus outlined his theories of calculus and gravitation and the laws of motion, providing a new understanding of the universe. A few years later, Newton had a serious breakdown, but recovered to be elected as an MP and appointed as Master of the Mint. He also became president of the Royal Society, and after his death in 1727, he was given a state funeral and buried with full honors in Westminster Abbey. He was, quote, a prickly individual, always up for a feud, says Heaton. Others have described him as secretive, neurotic, spiteful, vindictive, ruthless, arrogant, obsessive, and paranoid. Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> there's plenty of those people out there, we know. <laughs> he liked to think of himself as the new messiah come to save the world, according to Prof Professor Patricia Farah, a science historian at Cambridge University. But Newton's genius is undis undisputed. To everything he studied, everything he touched, religion, physics, mathematics, alchemy, and chemistry, he brought incredible depth and complexity and originality. These papers are likely to be uh, bought by a private collector, although institutional libraries may also put in bids. There is a huge amount of interest in scientific books and manuscripts. It's the biggest growth I've seen in the past 10 or 15 years, says Heaton. We have complex attitudes towards many historical figures, but the great heroes of science still stand tall as they ever did. It implies that he, I mean, just, I don't know, the idea that uh, that he was thinking about the apocalypse and thinking that there was a previous unknown civilization that had the keys and all, yeah. you know, it kind of lends to the idea that he thought there, you know, the biblical apocalypse that had already taken place had destroyed them. Yeah. And this was a relic from that civilization that was predicting the next one. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, it's like, that's cool. And we had asked that question too. Uh, I think when we were doing the Christopher Dunn series, the guy shows up and he's like hoping to find uh, the measure, you know, how to measure the world. Oh yeah. Right. It's yes. like, okay. They've so been doing why this did he go to the pyramid? It, yeah. Yeah. They, you know, there's, you can tell that there was, that some of the knowledge of what, what the pyramid actually contained had been known and it was at least spread around by word of mouth. If not, there were, you know, if there weren't documents, yeah, ancient documents that talked about it. Yeah. So I guess that we, we, we could say that Newton was an old school pyramid idiot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As Zahi Hawass would say, right? Yeah. These pyramid idiots that think that you can find all these secret, all this secret knowledge in the pyramid. And then they want to say that it's a coincidence that it actually has these proportions yeah. to the earth. It's like, yeah, but Newton, but people Newton before they thinking before yeah. they found those coincidental uh, dimensions, people were actually going there looking for that very thing. Yeah. And that's not, that's more than a coincidence. Right. I'm sorry. Yeah, that they thought they existed, and these were like the top thinkers of their time. Yeah. So yeah, that article was sent to us That's by awesome. sent to the Brothers of the Serpent email by Derek, and his one line in there before giving the link was, "As if there was any doubt, Isaac Newton was a snake bro." <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, Derek. That's really great. I've been I've been holding that one to read on the show. I have a whole stack of stuff, but uh, don't think we'll. We'll get to much more of it today, but I do have some... Yeah, other... Russ keeps saying, well, let's do another episode. I got this huge stack of stuff, and That's we right. did not getting any of it done. <laughs> yeah, well, then I was like, and we should also get George on, which <laughs> uh, which was great. Uh, but that ate into your uh, your stack of stuff time. That's right, stack of stuff time. Um, 
But you did the I had uh, another thing in the stack of stuff was the the Dixon wood the the artifact found so yeah. that one's good. So I have this one uh, also sent to us by a listener. And I think I mentioned this in the last show, and I probably I think I read his email in the last show. But this one's called uh, this was from nyu.edu, and it's called "Mass Extinctions of Land Dwelling Animals Occur in 27 Million Year Cycle." Mm. This is from December 11th, 2020. Uh, researchers find that timing of mass extinctions lines up with asteroid impacts and massive volcanic eruptions. And they have a picture here of the Deccan flood. Uh, basalt in India from the Deccan the traps. Deccan traps yeah. Mass extinctions of land-dwelling animals, including amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and birds, follow a cycle of about 27 million years, coinciding with previously reported mass extinctions of ocean life, according to a new analysis published in the journal Historical Biology. This study also finds that these mass extinctions align with major asteroid impacts and devastating volcanic outpourings of lava called flood basalt eruptions, providing potential causes for why these extinctions occurred. It seems that large body impacts and the pulses of internal Earth activity that create this kind of volcanism may be marching to the same 27 million year drumbeat as the extinctions, perhaps paced by our orbit in the galaxy says Mm. Michael Rampino, a professor of New York University's Department of Biology and the study's lead author. Wow. 66 million years ago, 70% of all species on land and in the seas, including the dinosaurs, suddenly went extinct in the disastrous aftermath of the collision of a large asteroid or comet with the Earth. Subsequently, paleontologists discovered that such a mass that such mass extinctions of marine life, in which up to 90% of species disappear were not random events, but seem to come in 26 million year cycles. In their historical biology study, Rampino and co-authors Ken uh, Caldera of the Carnegie Institution for Science and Yu Hong Zhu of New, uh, NYU's Center for Data Science examined the record of mass extinctions of land-dwelling animals and concluded that they coincide with the extinctions of ocean life. They also performed new statistical analyses of the extinctions of land species and demonstrated that those events follow a similar similar cycle of about 12, or I'm sorry, 27.5 million years. So, what could be causing the periodic mass extinctions on land and in the seas? Mass extinctions are not the only events occurring in cycles. The ages of impact craters created by asteroids and comets crashing to the Earth's surface also follow a cycle aligning with this extinction cycle. Astrophysicists hypothesize that periodic comet showers occur in the solar system every 26 to 30 million years, producing cyclical impacts and resulting in periodic mass extinctions. The sun and planets cycle through the crowded midplane of the Milky Way galaxy about every 30 million years. During these times, comet showers are possible, leading to large impacts on the Earth. The impacts can create conditions that would stress and potentially kill off land and marine life, including widespread dark and cold, wildfires, acid rains, and ozone depletion. These new findings of coinciding sudden mass extinctions on land and in the oceans and of the common 26 to 27 million year cycle lend credence to the idea of periodic global catastrophic events as the triggers for these extinctions, says Rampino. In fact, three of the mass annihilations of species on land and in the sea are already known to have occurred at the same times as the three largest impacts of the last 250 million years, each capable of causing a global disaster and resulting mass extinctions. These researchers were surprised to find another possible explanation beyond asteroids for mass extinction. The uh, flood basalt eruptions or giant volcanic eruptions that cover vast areas with lava. All eight of the coinciding mass die-offs in land and in the oceans matched times of these eruptions. These eruptions would also have created severe conditions for life, including brief periods of intense cold, acid rain, and ozone destruction, and increased radiation. Longer-term eruptions could lead to lethal greenhouse heating and more acid and less oxygen in the ocean. So the global mass extinctions were apparently caused by the largest cataclysmic impacts and massive volcanism, perhaps sometimes working in concert, said Rampino. So the guys studying the mass extinctions due to 
crazy volcanism is named Caldera. <laughs> Caldera, yeah. Uh, Caldera, okay. I, I thought that was, was very close. <laughs> Almost an afternoon, but yeah, one of the one of the co-authors is named Ken. Well, it's called Diera. Uh, yeah, I don't know yeah. how to say it. Yeah. Yep. I was trying to make it work. Right. <laughs> it's basically called Era, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So does that line up with the, the Younger Dryas period? Is that one of, would that be, fit into that cycle? Uh, because it's 66 million years. What was the timeline? The, the 20... About roughly 30 million, so 26 to 30 million years. Yeah. Um. Uh, so we're so we're in the window, yeah. Because I mean, the the error, yeah, is going to be millions of years. But yeah, so about twenty seven million year cycle. Uh, there's a drum beat, and yes, yeah, sixty six million years ago, which would be two cycles back. Right. Wow. Does this have anything to do with the galactic? Center alignment with the sun, or is that it's, just a perspective? That's a that's an Earth perspective. No, right? this has to do. Well, they're saying that um, because that's hap- that that's the sun and planet bounce up and down through the through midplane the, of the yeah, galaxy. Yeah, I know, but but yes, but there's a like if it has to do with perspective. I, yeah, I don't know the 2012 idea with precession and all of that. Is that well? Yeah, because that's just on the that's just about perspective on the on the, on the, um, the spring equinox. equinox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now this is more about they're they're saying that the whole solar system's moving up and down through the plane of the through the, the galactic, galactic plane. of the galaxy, yeah. yeah, basically, and it's it's when we're in the crowded, center. quote unquote, it's relatively center. crowded in, right in that plane. That's yeah. where the most mass is found. Now, how crowded it would be, but if you you know you, once you move through it, either you have external forces acting on very distant objects like Kuiper Belt or Oort cloud stuff, mm-hmm. or you have rogue objects coming in yeah. and throwing things around. So. Very interesting. Yeah. What uh, do you think, babe? Are we all going to die? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, you guys. <laughs> I mean, we're all going to die think, at and, some yeah. point. And we also all don't know. Yeah, I think we that's, all yes, don't that's know. That's exactly you, right. That's yeah. a great answer. That's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but maybe some of us won't die. I think that some people will probably survive. So forever? Just well, I mean, like the a, next cataclysm what if some of us extinction? are immortal and we don't know yet. <laughs> yes. We could be future immortals. I'm yeah. just saying, you know, there's a lot of possibilities out there. Yeah. So I if mean, you there's could aliens, number one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got that going on yeah, in the yeah. background all the yeah. time. We do. So do you think uh People will eventually be able to upload themselves into, like, you know, the whole, their entire consciousness into, like, a machine body or just even a computer state. Would you do it if you could? Well, the movies that they're making about that, when you watch them, you're like, oh, wow, that could work. <laughs> I mean, that's, I've thought that before. <laughs> movies that I mean, that's kind of what this. you do with movies, though, right? Yeah. You're supposed you're to, like, you're yeah, supposed like, to well, not. That could work. Yeah, yeah. I could kind of see how that could work. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah. But, I mean, I've felt that way about, you know, I watch indiana jones and i see him do impossible things i'm like yeah that probably could yeah that could, work. <laughs> could probably do that yeah well hey if you can see it you can believe it right isn't there, isn't yeah. there a saying like that I mean, you could totally use a whip to swing across you know snakes yeah. snakes and stuff yeah, yeah. it could completely yeah. work and then you just yank it it comes right off the thing that you just <laughs> used to hold your whole weight up it's really i think cool. since the snake bros <laughs> podcast has existed most people think that a lot of things are possible that were maybe seemingly impossible, impossible before. Yeah, like like us actually starting a podcast <laughs> 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 and keeping it going. Yeah, for this I mean, long. you've gone through a lot of book reports. You've had a lot of interviews with a lot of people. There's a lot of talk about a lot of things, and yeah, we're gonna do a show reunion, episode 200. That's right. Episode 200 project is underway, ladies and gentlemen. Go to the Discord. That's right. Or send us emails if you have clips mm-hmm. and favorite and parts. And there's a podcast birthday coming up. That's right. Yep. Yeah, we tried to figure out the birthday. I can't remember if I've ever talked about this on the show, but we've gone back and forth on when was the podcast's actual birthday. The working theory right now is, what's the date? I don't know. What is the date? You know what it is. I don't. I told you it, and then you were like, I'll remember that because something else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> the working theory right now is that it's February 28th. Right. Is the birthday of the podcast. Yeah. And what, the way I eventually figured that out was I went to look and see when did I create the Brothers of the Serpent Gmail address. Because that, to me, marks the beginning. Because, because one of the conditions on starting the show was sort of like... You had to sign up for stuff. I had dude. to sign up for stuff, and I needed to. And Kyle was like, "You need to make an RSS feed so that this is legit. Otherwise, we're just re we're just recording ourselves talking about stuff, and we don't have anywhere to put it." So I was yeah. like, "Okay, I'll try to figure out how to make an RSS feed." So uh, we went back and forth on what we we're going to call ourselves when we came up with Brothers of the Serpent name, and we decided, "All right, that we'll go, we'll go with that." I made the Gmail account, and then I made the Blogger account so that I could sign up for FeedBurner. <laughs> What? What are you laughing about? That's, just, that's basically the genesis of the podcast. I was like, I hit record, and I was like, my job's done, dude. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> now you need to hold up your end of the deal. <laughs> Bring all the material. <laughs> make the RSS. I don't know any of this internet yeah. junk. Kyle was like, I'm not going to even. You, get, you figure all that stuff out, and we'll do a podcast. And I think I he got was, the recording. I think he, yeah. I think he was thinking like. Done deal. We won't even have to. I won't even have to worry about this because Russ is never going to figure all that shit out. <laughs> but I was like, no. oh, okay. So then I came down. I was like, all right, I think I got it. And then we tried something, and that didn't work. But anyway, the beginning, I was able to find out when the email address was created, and that's when I decided it's probably the best actual indication of the birth of the podcast. It's probably not yeah, when yeah. we recorded the first episode because we did that first. I think. Yeah, but it, that's cool. It, we'll, we'll keep it at that because Laura likes it. Yeah. Well, I like it for two reasons. Well, I remember it for two reasons. One, I was like, well, thank God I wasn't on February 29th leap year because then that would have been, <laughs> been messy. <laughs> right? That never <laughs> occurred to me. Okay, yeah, you're right. Uh, and the other reason is because I got my real estate license on February 28th. So that's my license. Right. So she'll birthday. remember yeah. it for us. Yeah. Because the same I, thing with me. I, and I don't want to change it because then, you know, I might mess that up. Right. Because I can go look at, you know, when episode <laughs> two <laughs> was recorded. Well, it's the same. But thing I'm not going to do it. Me, because wasn't two years ago leap year? Because I'm pretty sure when I got I my no license, no, I know, remember babe. looking at the calendar and thinking, Thank God I didn't get my license on February 29th. <laughs> we were probably <laughs> celebrating the anniversary until four years from now. <laughs> we spend a whole lot more time talking about how calendars come about than actually looking following at calendars. the calendar. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. right. <laughs> okay. So anyway, we're both on February 28th, and that's make makes it. So a that lot means easier. that Laura will remember it for us that's because right. <laughs> she mentioned it the other day. She's like, the podcast birthday is coming up. I was like, oh really? Because <laughs> I'm about to have to do my renewal for my license. So it's like they go they go together. Yeah. yeah, but really, if it would have been February 29th for both of us, like, how would we right. handle that? For a while, I thought it was April, but that's because I went to the website and looked at the earliest post because yeah. the website keeps the blog keeps track of it. But I realized that the first 50 ish posts are all the same date because after we you had done so it. many episodes, I went in there and added some tracking stuff to the links. Yeah. And of course, Blogger then when I when you update those posts. It changes the date of the post and doesn't tell you the original. It just yeah. tells you the last time you updated it. Yeah. So, I don't know, the first 30-something posts or whatever all have the same date because I did all of it in the same day. And so yeah. I couldn't tell when the— So the 200 episode will be sometime in the summer is what we— It's Yeah, it's about six months. Roughly. Yeah. Half so year. do we call Barring it? catastrophes and not skipping weeks and, you know, if, if everything goes well and we continue to publish one show— one normal numbered episode a week. Sometime in the summer. We'll it be should there. show up a little less Which than we six do months. by hook or by crook. That's right. <laughs> so, done. The, so February 28th, we have, do we call it a podcast birthday or a podcast anniversary? What do you actually call that? We'll figure that out later. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Well, I'm a super planner. So here we are. <laughs> Either one. Fine with me. <laughs> it would be the anniversary of starting the podcast and also the birth date of the podcast, right? I mean, it's the same thing. Let's call it a birthday. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe maybe the Snake Force can help us decide what it's called. Maybe they'll come up with a better name. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The day the podcast was hatched. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> from it from its primordial egg. Yeah. <laughs> That's really good. I like that. <laughs> Way to steal the thunder of the Snake Force. <laughs> I just knew what they were going to say. I mean, <laughs> he's so I'm in, in the Discord. The, yeah, he's uh, yeah. so in tune with the Snake Force. Is this it? Are we wrapping it up? Are we yeah, I think we're wrapping it up. Okay. Uh, I, I have one and a half things to say when, you, when I get my turn.
Okay, so you guys know the email, brothersoftheservant at gmail.com, and the website, brothersoftheservant.com. We mentioned last show about the Public thing. So this has been finalized. The, the affiliate account has been uh, approved. And it was a little bit too late for me to use it on the last one. So on this episode, I'm telling you, we got an affiliate account now. I'm going to be changing the link on the website in the Snakeskins area for purchasing merchandise from TeePublic. I'm changing the link to the affiliate link. And I'm also going to put that a link in the in the show notes for this episode. <clears throat> and I'll probably put a post on Twitter about it. She asked me, the, the Public girl asked me to put a post on Twitter about it. So I'll probably do that too. So thanks very much to Public. That's really cool because an affiliate... Uh, us being an affiliate gives us 11% of whatever is sold. But since we also make our own artwork, that 15% or whatever is also added on. So we get, you know, we're getting a bigger chunk. So when you're both the, the person who's promoting the sales plus the art, the artist who made the artwork that's mm. being promoted and sold, you get both of those. Oh, okay, cool. So what we've had this whole time has just been the artist account the one that you can just sign up and make yeah but those are those accounts are actually for people who are just making what they think are cool t-shirt art art yeah. not necessarily the people who are promoting them and getting them sold i see right so she was like yeah since you have a podcast and you're actually doing the promotions and selling them as well you need to get this affiliate account because okay. that's who you guys are that makes sense, and yeah. since you're making your own artwork you also get that cut so I both of them it. together sweet so buy a bunch of snake bro stuff now <laughs> with the links in the show notes and on the website and also thanks so much to T Public to reaching out to us and yes. setting us straight on that. Uh, that's really awesome. So I really appreciate them. And uh, if you, if you guys, you know, if you're a podcaster or you just feel like making T-shirts, check them out. You can set up an account for free, and you can make the art, put it in there, and then get the T-shirts. It's really cool. Even and, if you just want one for yourself. <laughs> and T Public has given me a little bit more leverage with so what. I can be like, hey, that's true, yeah. T Publix, yeah. really dishing it out over here. <laughs> you guys want to get in on that? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So check that out and uh, help us with the pyramid scheme. Uh, thanks so much to all of you who have, and thanks especially to Anne. You're so awesome. Yeah, uh, she sent us another huge donation. It's just really cool. So all of you people who do donate and help us send, send us straight to pyramids we are going to get there one day as we were talking with George earlier it's going to happen and yeah. uh, you guys are helping make it happen and you've already you know we use this whole get to pyramids in a very euphemistic like what we mean is go out and look at stuff <laughs> it doesn't necessarily have to be actually pyramids so when we went to Arizona and explored all those ancient landscapes with Randall and we're looking at you know we looked at uh, Pueblo stuff there mm -hmm. uh it, that was sending us straight to pyramids uh in the way we use the, the phrase so yeah. one day we'll actually get to the actual pyramids too but this was <laughs> i'm just saying thank you guys so much so yeah. you can find the pyramid scheme links for patreon and paypal on the website yeah and i also wanted to get a special thanks to john slaymaker ah yes yeah dude your uh your youtube comments and the cosmographia page really appreciate it uh and we're glad you're one of us, buddy. That's right. He is one of us. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Wading into the YouTube comments ah. on behalf of the Snake Bros. Appreciate that. <laughs> and I want to also give a special thanks to Tony Petrangelo oh, yes. for your Christmas card. It is on my fridge. Our fridge. She hasn't even shown it to me yet, though. Like, you see this? You, you send us Snake Bros Christmas cards, and Laura opens them and hangs them on her fridge and never even tells me. <laughs> I love getting Christmas cards. It's a special thing. I get them, I put them on the fridge, and it adds to my collection. So, yeah. yes, I forgot to bring the Christmas card in here with the boxes because it's sitting happily on my fridge. So I can look at your family every time I go to get a drink or a snack. That's or... cool. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, thanks, bud. Appreciate that. Uh, give us reviews at the uh, Apple Podcast uh, store. That really helps spread the show. And thanks to all of you who have. I think there's, well, depending on who you look at who's counting, there's either 200 or 300 reviews there. So. <laughs> I'm not sure what, what that means. <laughs> you go to when you go to the Apple Podcast, it says 200 and something reviews. When you go to when I when you use Chartable, which is using all their data from there, they say 300. So I don't know what the difference in counting means. I don't know either. Uh, but yeah, but thanks to all of you who have done that. Join the Discord. There's a link for it on the website. Uh, check out the Library of the Serpent link there also uh, on the website. And thanks to History Ship for making all our YouTube videos. Really appreciate, it, buddy. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, Merry Christmas to you. 
And uh, Pod Doodles, you're awesome, bro. Keep doing your art. I love uh, I love how you do that stuff. And so everybody should check that out. He makes doodles while listening to podcasts, including ours. So check him out. Yeah. And uh, so we love those guys, but we also love all of you. Always have. Always will. Good night, Adamu. I love you the most. Get back to work. Get back to work.